Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the northeast corner of brilliant South Africa. We're in the Kruger National Park, iconic national park of the world. That in, combined with a little piece in Zimbabwe called Gonera Zoo and a little piece in Mozambique called the Limpopo National Park combined make up three and a half million hectares of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. That is a lot of land, eight million acres. You're looking at a golden, not a golden tail, you're looking at a cardinal woodpecker, uh, so named for the little red cap that it has on the back of its head, a little bit like a cardinal might. A cardinal, for those of you who don't know, is a bishop of the Catholic Church, and they tend to wear those little hats on the backs of their heads. He's still there, so I'm going to ask David to just stay with him, because we don't often see them. And David is on camera. That's why I said I'm going to ask David to stay with him. And I said him because that is a male cardinal woodpecker that has flown over the side and away from view. My name is James Hendry, and you are on a live safari here from that complicated piece of land that I described to you. It is a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, mainly because it's not very hot at the moment. There's been a little bit of drizzle. The drought is by no means broken and you are on a live safari. So please talk to us, hashtag safari live if you're on Twitter, or questions at wildearth.tv, something's in my eye. If you're on the internet, that's not part of the, um, that's not part of the email address. Um, questions at wildearth.tv, something's in my eye won't work for you. Just questions at wildearth.tv. Then there's a bit of a bird party going on around here at the moment, and you may be able to hear, Dave, there's a, there's a starling up in the top of the tree there. And you may be able to hear behind me, in fact, that's a forktail drongo. What you may be able to hear behind me, some rattling cesticulars going psh, 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 psh. There's some southern black tits going tick, 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 And there are also some white-browed scrub robins around here going And there is a flock of babblers. I'm just going to go a little bit forward. A flock of arrow marked babblers, so named for the fact that they have arrow marks on their breasts. Quite difficult to see really on camera. But let's try them. And while we're doing that, let me just introduce you to the rest of the people who are going to make be part of your afternoon safari today. Scott Dyson, the enormous, is on the other vehicle. He is being filmed by the diminutive Wiem Dorenbrach, unless I'm much mistaken. And in the final control, we have Kirsten on the vocals, and I th think Nikki is on the keys. And what that means is that Nicola will be feeding through questions to Kirsten, who will then relay them to me in her ear. Kirsten will decide as and when I get boring enough to swap over to Scott. That's generally how it works. Scott is heading to Arethusa, and that's why we haven't found him, or why you haven't seen him just yet. He's going to see what he can find there. I think he's actually tracking something as we speak. Perhaps the pug marks of shadow have made themselves known, and he's going to try and find them. That is the arrow marked bab. No, it's not. That's a grey-headed sparrow. So named because it has a grey head, obviously. Everything is quite subdued this afternoon. I quite like it. It's a very different feeling from the blinding light of the incredible February heat that we've had. The hottest month on record in 112 years of record keeping. Quite astonishing heat we have here today or this year. Uh, David, you seem to have lost a pillow. Excuse me, everyone. I'm just going to retrieve David's pillow. I think he brings it along in case I get really boring. Would you like to show everybody your pillow? Or? Thank you, James. It's quite a thick pillow here. Of course, pretty nice to have if the, your presenter drives like I do. There we go, David. You can sit on that now. Your bottom shall be protected from the bumps in the road. All right, on we go. I'd like to spend some time with the hyenas today, but I think that'll be a bit later. We're going to head off towards Biffle's Hook Dam at the moment, see what we can find there. Scott is ready to greet you, and I will hand you over to him. Hello, everyone, and welcome on board with myself, and Viam on camera. If you have yet to be on safari with me before, my name is Scott, and 
I'm really loving this cool weather, cloudy weather. We've got a little bit of drizzle today. It's obviously better than nothing, as VM showing you the cloud cover. I mean, the, the, the tiny amount of drizzle we've, we've had, like I say, is, is better than nothing, but not nearly enough to really help this parched landscape. But just the fact that it's cool is even giving these plants a little bit of peace from the relentless sun that's been baking them. I mean, if you look at a lot of these trees, the leaves are all facing downwards, looking a lot more sorry for themselves than they ordinarily should be. And even though they are green, they just lack that usual turgid rigidity that you would usually see. And they are battling. Anyway, we certainly aren't on this cool day. And hopefully the animals are also enjoying the cool weather. Predators will be far more inclined to be on the move earlier on on a day like this. So good prospects for this afternoon. I'm not sure if James updated you, but the Inkawuma Pride is across on Sibambili, north and west of Arethusa and Juma. So they're across there. And Debbie in Vancouver, you've heard some strange deep gargling noises. So it wasn't the Inkohuma pride. We know that they're too far away from the Juma Watsall camera. But you suggested that it could possibly be the sound of impalas rutting that you heard. And it definitely is possible, even though it doesn't make sense for them to be making that rutting noise at this time of the year. Sometimes a few of the males will get excited. Um, but I certainly haven't heard that noise for, for quite some time. There was a little bit of an increase in that kind of impala gurgle at the second carving of, of young impala lambs, which basically probably happened about three weeks ago. We started seeing a few much smaller impala lambs that were born. And like I said, that's from a kind of less well-known second rut that occurs for those females who didn't fall pregnant in the initial ruts uh, in May. So I don't think it's, it's anything too serious. I don't think it's the drought that's causing that. And, I mean, maybe it is, but I don't think that is the case. Ah, oh, VM's just spotted some male impala. One of which could be Nelson, the one-horned individual. And maybe if we just watch their behavior for a while, Debbie, we'll be able to deduce whether there's some excitement in the air for the male impala. Now, I'm told if this is Nelson, he's also blind in one eye. That looks like it could be him. I've only got a kind of, that left eye doesn't look very good. And I think it is the left eye and the left horn that is not functional for Nelson. And his horn would have been broken up during rutting, during fighting, um, that impalas will do amongst one another, like I said, mainly in the month of May, which is their main rutting period. And roughly six months after that, they'll give birth around November. Not the males, of course. Let's carry on. I haven't left VM with much of an angle there, and the impala have disappeared behind the bushes. That was a woodpecker we heard cheeping behind us then. I know you saw a cardinal woodpecker, the smallest woodpecker. I think that could have actually been one calling behind us there as well. Our plans for this afternoon are to head across onto Arethusa where we don't spend as much time as we do on Juma. So every now and then, it's quite nice to head across there just to see what's going on. And there is a chance that the Inkahuma Pride might move south from where they are on Sibambili, and that will take them onto Arethusa where we can view them. See, and there's a little black bird that's just landed up in this tree here. It could well flutter off, it already has. Oof, yeah, it's gone. Um, as did a flock of small white crowned helmet tracks, so we'll skip that. But it was a common scimitable that I was hoping to show you. Always worth a gamble. So like I said, we're going to head across onto Arethusa, um, see what's going on there. Again, I'm just trying to increase our chances as much as possible of seeing the Anderson male leopard. And in order to do that, we need to go as far west as we possibly can onto the western boundary of Arethusa. That is kind of 
with his most north and western uh, proximity of his, his kind of territory. So we'll go across there and see what's going on. Also, because none of us were out this, uh, this morning, we're not too sure what happened across there. I also haven't seen Shadow for quite some time, a female leopard, so maybe we'll get lucky with her. Hello, Ryan on YouTube. And you would like to know if the Inkuhuma Pride crossed out last night, and yes, they did, uh, onto Sibambili. Just gonna get a little marker here. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is show you exactly what their movements were and I've been trying to incorporate my map a lot more these days because I think it may help you guys greatly in understanding exactly kind of what we are dealing with here in terms of traversing. So the square on the right is Juma, the square on the left, or well, it's more of a rectangle, um, is Arethusa. So Sibambili is this little thin green strip of property over here and I'm just going to zoom in so uh, Sydney's dam is just up over there. Um, you can't see it. Um, the green is where we cannot go, the white is where we can. And the lion were lying up literally where the end of my stick is over there. And then last night they moved straight west into Sibambili. So they're somewhere in this area. How far west, I'm not too sure, but they're in this area. This is about a, a kilometer. Um, so probably more, more, more like half a mile from the northern boundary of the Saabi Sands, which is a fence, to the northern boundary of Arethusa. So it's not a huge patch of uh, uh, area, this, only about 800 meters. And then if you extrapolate that, you may be able to get an idea of how big the, the rest of our properties are. Not huge, it's only about 2,000 hectares that we traverse. And we currently are this little blue dot over here. So we are making our way west towards Arethusa, where we're gonna check along this western boundary, along the Marikeni drainage for the Anderson male leopard, or anything else interesting that we may come across along the way. So there we go, Ryan. That's exactly what the, those ladies did last night. The beautiful Balanites tree after which the road we're about to turn onto is named after. Hello, Astralina, and you would like to know if James and Brent had any luck out on the night drive last night? Did they see anything interesting? Um, to be honest, I'm not too sure whether they did. I don't think it was anything mind-boggling, though. I mean, it was a lot of fun being out after dark. Um, but I've just been reminded by Kirsty in the final control that Brent managed to find a tiny, tiny chameleon. So there we go. I was wrong. And that was an awesome uh, sighting and well spotted by Brent. Um, anything else? Not, not too sure. I mean, I was mainly testing the cameras and there was a few tech difficulties where the lions were sleeping. There was no signal. Um, so that made things a little bit complicated towards the end of the, uh, the, the safari. Uh, but it certainly is just good fun being out after dark, doing something a little bit different, and of course having you guys along. So, Estralina, sorry that you couldn't join us, but I can report that it was nothing extraordinary that you possibly missed out on. Unless, of course, a baby chameleon was what you wanted to see. It's tricky business at night, um, and that's why we're trying to, to do more tests and get to grips with the complexities that make uh, filming after dark uh, difficult. So definitely a few steps in the right direction and understanding what we need to do in terms of equipment in order to be able to do that job a little bit better going forward. nocturnal sighting that I have not told you guys about is a couple of nights ago when we got a report that there were some leopards at the Juma waterhole, we quickly raced away from the DRC into that direction and we had a feeling that it was Tingana and Tandi. Uh, when we raced down there, we found Karula there, but on our way down to the waterhole, 
we saw a civet, which I think had actually just taken a drink before we got there. And it's an animal that we don't see it often at all. So it was, I know it was Nikki's first sighting, Kirsty's first sighting. Um, I think it was probably one of my first or second or third sightings here at Juma as well. And as, uh, even though we see their tracks every day, we never see the, see the animals, which is interesting. They, for some reason, have been uh, dodging us. So I'm just going to show you what one looks like in a book. I like to describe it as an African raccoon. Tell me what you guys think. There it is. It's the one on the top picture. The bottom picture that I've covered with my thumb is an African palm civet, which they make that funny, special, uh, expensive coffee out of that's in the funny movie with, uh, what's his name again? Is it Jack Nicholas? No. What's his name? Cope Luwak, I think, is the, is, the, um, is, the, is the coffee. But it's a terrible trade where these animals are kept in cages so that they can feed on coffee beans and then defecate them. And that's what's uh, highly sought after a kind of coffee, the ones that have passed through the digestive systems of the African palm civet. So they've, in a kind of horrible industry, they're being maltreated and their population is threatened due to that. But our African civet doesn't have that problem. It isn't it beautifully, beautifully patterned? They feed on mainly insects, but also rodents, birds, reptile, carrion, fruits in their uh, civet trees or their latrines where they defecate, kind of like an internet cafe, they'll, they'll defecate and set spots so that other civets in the area can go there and pick up information on them. And at their civet trees, you'll often find millipede rings, which is interesting because millipedes are highly toxic to most animals, but a civet can eat them. And you'll also find the, the fruits of a lot of tree. Uh, the trees, especially jackalberry trees, you'll often find berries in and amongst their, their latrines. And it's a good opportunity to mention that a latrine is for predators or carnivores, and a midden is a dung site or defecating site for the herbivores. Hello to Raven, and I think you may be joining for the first time. It's so good to have you with us, and thanks for sending a question through. You watching all the way in the UK, and I hope all is well over there. I'm guessing it could be a little bit gloomy like it is over here today. As a general rule, that's the weather I'm told you guys experience a lot. Raven, you're interested to know about honey badgers. And uh, funny you say that because when Brent was out the vehicle last night uh, showing how small the chameleon was in relation to his pinky finger, VM, who I'm teamed up today with on camera, told him to be careful not to be eaten by the honey badgers. And that kind of partly answers your question. You'd like to know if they are nocturnal. Um, in this area, I would say, yes, they are more nocturnal than diurnal, but they are not a strictly nocturnal animal. They will move during the day, and every honey badger that I've seen in the Sabi Sands, which is probably around 10 in total now, after a kind of a total of four years of being here, not with Safari Live, but at other, other camps nearby, they've all been seen during the day. Um, but they are definitely more active at night and that's why we don't see them because we're not active. We are not active too much after dark, whether they, whereas they are. And that's for a number of reasons, but I think mainly the temperature here. It's the same reason why even the lions of this area will also predominantly move at night, um, whereas our lions in other areas of Africa where there's cooler climates will often do uh, quite a lot of their moving during the day. So it all depends on the individuals. Um, We've only managed to capture them on film a few times, Raven. I think James Henry is the man for the job, so when you jump back onto his vehicle, try and urge him to find you one. I've yet to get one on camera. Oh, we are in action, we are in action. Wild dogs could come chasing after these Impala. Please, wild dog, keep coming. Come on. Or oh, they're just running for joy. It looks like they could just be jumping for joy in this cool weather, which is equally as nice. Awesome! Look at this! Jumping for joy. And they do that interesting pronking kind of jump where they lift their two back legs as far back as possible and their front legs and they kind of spatchcock themselves in the air for as long as possible. And they'll do that to show predators that they are in perfect condition, they are great athletes, they are not injured, 
And here they come again. This is going to be great. Look at that. This is that pronking run saying, look at me, look at how fast I am, look at how well I can run. And this is an epic view. They're coming even closer here. This is magical. Right past us, so many of them. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it is this cool weather, the tiny little bit of drizzle that's putting a smile on these herbivores' faces, even though it's just a glimmer of hope. It's reason to celebrate for them, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Isn't it wonderful to see animals so playful and just like us, um, kind of expressing their emotions? You could see that they were happy there. Mothers running with their young. I initially thought there was going to be a wild dog bearing down after them, which I was saddened by the fact that they weren't initially, but now I'm happy just to see that the impala are happy. As I say that, the drizzle starts to build on my right cheek. The wind's blowing from east to west. And isn't this interesting, Debbie? Here they come again. Here comes a male right at the back doing the impala ruts that you may hear. I'm sure they're going to take a similar trajectory. Now they've changed. But there was a male right at the back. So isn't this fascinating, Debbie? You heard that sound a little bit earlier. And now the impala are displaying. Yeah, look at that speed. You may just be able to hear the snorts of the male who's chasing, I think, from the rear of the herd, although now I've, just, I've lost a lot of them now. How awesome. Well, I'm not going to go anywhere. I think they're going to keep coming back. But the drizzle is building. I guess James might be covering his vehicle up in its protective gear. And while he gets his vehicle ready, I guess we can take a little bit of punishment from the weather, and then we may need to, to send you across to him in order for us to cover up this vehicle. It's just a very fine mist at the moment. You can hardly probably see it building on me, but it, it is here. Here the Impala come again. <laughs> this is too good. I mean, you'd think they'd be a little bit tired by now. They have covered, I mean, quite a lot of distance in a very, very short space of time. I mean, it's such a wonderful display of their speed and agility. And also when they jump and pronk like that, you understand why it's difficult for predators to catch them. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Obviously, you know, when animals start acting like this, it's risky business because if a leopard was in the area, it would quite easily be able to stalk up to a point where it just needs to wait for these things to come hurtling past and it can jump out and latch onto one. And it's actually interesting that this last rutting season that we had, we didn't find any dead impala or male impalas because during uh, the impala rut, because they are so vocal, it can be uh, incredible to be sitting with a leopard who's kind of fast asleep up in a tree, and then all of a sudden uh, you hear this as the <laughs> that was a terrible impersonation. As always, my impersonations are never never really good. But these impala make this bizarre snorting, burping, gurgling roar, and you'll find that that can often get leopard up from a deep comatose sleep and heading straight in that direction because they know they're going to come across preoccupied males. And I've actually seen a few photographic sequences and even videos of impalas who've got their horns locked and a leopard literally like runs up to them and jumps on one while they're still fighting. The impala doesn't even realize that the leopard's there until it's on its back. So good hunting opportunities for the predators when the antelope are rutting or even playing like this. So. This is shadows territory. We would need shadow to be here in order for any action to unfold like that. But I don't think that would actually be a nice way to finish that wonderful sighting we've had of the Impalalas. Good. I'm going to send you across to James now. VM and I are going to probably think about wrapping up this vehicle. But as I say, that the rain has kind of dissipated. Anyway, we will see you in a short while. One. Hello, everybody. I'm off. Uh, well, I'm just investigating this little tree here. Now, we often talk about the damage that elephants do, and you can see this for this tree, it's been an unhappy time of it. 
but there are three or four different species of ants, a frog hopper of a different kind. And what I just want to do is cut you a piece here of this amazing inner flesh, and uh, you're going to taste it vicariously through David, who's going to give you a piece of it. There's some vehicle behind us, so I'm going to have to be quite... Good afternoon, Ephraim. No, Very I'm Ed's uh, I'm heading across to Arapuza now, but James is uh, right. around where dinner. Go. We think you Now, this is the inner bark of the tree. And what it is, it tastes delicious. That's what all those ants were eating, David. Thank eat that good. on behalf of all of our wonderful viewers. And tell me what it tastes like. Mmm. What does it taste like, David? That's tasty, Joe. Quite sweet. Mm, very sweet. Feels, tastes nutritious. And that is what all of those ants and the frog hopper there are eating. They're sucking on that juice that is seeping out of that, uh, it's a red thorn tree, Acacia gerardii. Very delicious. Oh, let me plug myself back in again. I'm glad you've been spending so much time with the impala. I feel that's important. Very, very beautiful animals, of course, and they're very underrated. I'm just going to get out of this way of this fellow who is clearly in an enormous rush. Go on then. It's always nice to have the drain surgeon's Land Rover go past you on drive. I mean, it's, I suppose after the weekend, of course, probably going to Bibbles Hook, lots of people have been there. You know, the pipes get blocked up, I suppose. We are on the Bibbles of cut line. Now, so like I was saying, because the drought is so bad, um, the elephants are eating trees most of the time now, which is normally what they do in the winter time. But they are creating all the little niches for small creatures to live, and they're creating little sources of food for creatures that wouldn't normally have those sources of food at this time of year. So although the drought can be a fairly nasty thing to look at, it is wonderful for some things, and you know, it does change things completely, which I think is great. to know if there's a good reason to visit the Sabi Sands. You're in Berlin. My sister was visiting there this year. I have a good season to visit the Sabi Sands. There, well, there are thousands of good reasons, and there are four good seasons to come. It just depends on the time of year that you prefer, the kind of climate you prefer, and it really does, it, I mean, it, it, is very, it is different at different times of year, but it's equally good. So, you can come during a wet season, I mean, round about now, it should be wet, but it isn't, and you'd come and everything would be verdant and lush, and while the game is probably slightly more sparsely distributed, simply because there is normally more water at this time of the year, it's still a very stunning time to be here. Then you could come in the middle of the winter months, sort of between June and September, when the grass has died back and the trees have got no leaves on them. And you can see further into the bush. It looks like a harsher landscape if you're not used to that kind of a winter, but it's still magnificent, I find. I love those colors, that, that sort of golden brown color that covers the bush at that time of year. It's not too cold here. It drops to about four degrees Celsius on the really cold days. Um, but in, by the midday, it's up around 23, 24. So really not unpleasantly cold at all at any time of the year. So that would be winter. And then you've got the times in between. I think one of my favorite times of the year is coming up now. That will be sort of March to the end of May. When we, it's not cold in the mornings, but that blinding heat of the summer has gone away. It's been a particularly hot summer this year. It's not always that hot. But that sort of March to May time for me is, uh, is my favorite time in this particular part of the Sabi Sands. The rest of the country is different, you know, all the time. Thank you for that draw. Sally, I'm getting your question, I think. I'm just gonna ask for it again. The plug here is a little bit suspect. Ah, 
Now, you want to know when we're going to get some steady rain. Sally, I don't know. I really don't know when we're going to get steady rain. It should be now. We should be receiving it now. We're, yeah, we're in the back end of the worst drought probably in 100 years. So it really is totally impossible to say when we're going to get our next bout of steady rain. It should be now. This is the wettest, normally the wettest month of the year. And obviously that isn't the case at the moment. Right, we're reach, reaching the northeast corner of the reserve. Down to the south is where we're going to go on the uh, Cheetah Cut Line. And we'll head towards Biffleswick Dam and see what we can find there. Just as a, just for the sake of visiting it really, there's no water there of course. Heidi, you're obviously an ornithologist of no ill repute. You're in North Carolina, and you want to know about the black heron night heron, which you say you saw on one of our feeds, on one of the camera feeds last year, last night. And it was an Afrikan feed, I think you were looking at. Heidi, uh, it's just starting to drizzle a little bit. I think we're okay for now, David. Are we okay for now? Um, you want to know if we get them here? We do. If it gets wet, if it gets wet here, we do get them, especially the water holes. They'll hang around at night. And certainly down south, where there's some slightly larger dams and the river, we absolutely do get the black crown night heron. Lovely, lovely bird. Really attractive bird. I would show you a picture, but it's just drizzling a bit, and I don't wish to get me uh, me book dirty. Lots of tracks of buffalo going up and down this cut line sometime during the course of the day, but I think they've gone north. They have, that's towards the back of the car and into Bufflesook, where of course we can't traverse. This is Torchwood to our eastern side or your left, and Juma or Vuyatela to the right hand side. Just so very pleasant having this weather. I know it's Probably can't look like that to you, but it really is lovely. <laughs> and one of the things we did this afternoon early on at about half past two was that we, well, it wasn't half, it was, it wasn't half past two for the people concerned, it was half past seven in the morning. We did a, a show to a school in Florida, in Virginia Beach. And Eric Moore, you say that everyone enjoyed it. I'm so very glad. It was wonderful to have questions from the biology class there. I think it was Miss Daniels' biology class. It was really nice talking to the youngsters about the wilderness here. Okay, we're going to head across to Scott. We'll just do a little bit of cleaning up of this drizzle on the lens, and I'll catch up with you at Bubbles McGann. Hello, everybody. And... We've covered up, we've got the little kind of rain cover on. There's not much that you can see here, but most of the important equipment that needs covering up is behind me. So we've got our cover on as James is going to put his on now. And I've just got an update from Cedric at Arethusa, one of the guides across here. We are on Arethusa now. And there's good news, the Inkahuma Pride moved south and west away from where they were on Sibambili, north of where we can go, and they did come on to Arethusa. I'm guessing this was late this morning. So we are going to help the guys try to find them in this area. But the interesting thing is, uh, because we um, were late to, to get into this area, there's already three vehicles searching for them. And how it works when uh, the guiding teams are working in areas that you'll have a limit of three vehicles searching one spot. You spotted some tracks for him? Yeah, I can't see Okay, let me, let me just jump out quickly. So, like I was saying, um, once you've got to an area where people know that there's lions or leopard in a certain area, they'll only allow three vehicles to go there. And the reason for that is that if that animal gets found or that pride gets found, there's a limit to three vehicles that can view them. So we are a fourth vehicle helping out in that area. And I told the guys, don't worry. If we find them, you guys can all go ahead and we'll come in later. So just some interesting kind of dynamics as to what's going on. Well, VM thought he saw some tracks and he is often the one to help us finding tracks. And it's wonderful how the cameramen have 
all become so useful that basically safari guides how to work a camera now. Um, but I don't think I can see any tracks up ahead. I may have driven over some. They could have crossed behind us. I'm just going to check behind quickly. No, it looks all clear. It could have been something else. And in this overcast light, it is difficult to be certain um, about whatever tracks you may be seeing on the ground. Good. Always worth making sure there's nothing worse on safari if you um, think you see something and you carry on driving and you don't say anything. It just burns you because you never know was it the track? Was it a leopard that I saw? Should I have said something? So my advice to guests who are out on safari is if there's a shadow of a doubt, stop the car and make sure. Otherwise, you've just got this strange feeling of uncertainty for the rest of the drive. Walt, uh, who has only recently joined the Safari Live family, has asked a special request of me. And you would like to find a good view and picture of a waterbuck so that you can get a screenshot and use it as your YouTube profile picture. That I would certainly love to help you with, Walt, the waterbuck picture. <laughs> And the good news is, is at the Arathusa Waterhole, it's one of the best places to see waterbuck on all of our area of traverse. So once we've had a quick look around for these line, if we don't have any luck, we will take you across to get your picture, at least certainly try to get your picture on or at the Arathusa Waterhole. Now, I've just seen Shanae behind us is one of the Encoral guides, and I'm just going to pull over quickly because she's got a tracker on her vehicle. So rather than us blundering ahead, I've just found a long lady's hair here that you may have seen in the screen that I'll get rid of. Um, so like I said, it's definitely not VMs. He's not he's saying he's got nothing to do with it. But like I say, Shanae and her tracker, who are just arriving here. Hello, Shanae. Hi. How are you doing? Hello. Good. Hello, everyone. Hello. I thought, yeah, very good. I thought I'd let you go ahead so that you can <laughs> show us how to find the tracks as opposed to us ruin them. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Cool. cool. They, they usually show us when we say we want to see something, so it, it works. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it, it, I'm sure it does. Cool, Shanae. Nice cool weather as well today, which is a pleasant change of scenery. It's better than burning sunshine. Promise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, good luck. And we'll. S we'll yeah. Please do. Okay. See you later. So important to chat to whoever you can when out on safari because you may not know when you'll be seeing the next humanoids. It's mainly animals that we interact with out here. And Shanae, interestingly enough, and this is a wonderful story. I'm not sure, did you, did you get the camera onto her there, Vian? Did you manage to? Okay, Vian managed to get, get the camera onto her, which is great. I couldn't see because I was facing away from the little monitor here. Um, Shanae discovered safari and safari live. Well, she is an ex-South African that lives in New Zealand, or well, lived in New Zealand. I'm not too sure when she left, but basically, she has come back out and trained to become a guide, and she's only recently started guiding her own guests, and it's so awesome for her. She was living in New Zealand. She was one of our huge uh, Safari Live fans. She used to send through questions all the time. She used to take great screenshots, and we knew her before she even arrived here, and it's just been wonderful to, to get to know her a little bit better uh, in the few months that she has been here doing her training, and now to see her fledged into a real working guide is not only a wonderful story just for her, but it's a wonderful uh, lesson for everyone. But if you do want to come out here and do your training course and become a safari guide, it's every bit as possible as it was for Shanae. It doesn't matter how old you are, what race or gender, anyone can do it.
Good news. Well, as we follow Shanae through the African wilderness, as we hope that she finds the lions, we are going to send you back to James, who's found a bird. Now that there, everybody, is a Birchall starling, not the particularly good example. It was sitting very close to us, and that what I wanted to show you was the iridescence in its feathers. Now we might be able to get them as it flies off there. So I'm just gonna roll forward. And the reason I wanted to show you the iridescence in its feathers is because it, I think it's got a really fascinating story behind it. In birds, there are only three pigments that birds can possibly have, and they are yellow, orange, and red. That bird is clearly neither yellow, orange, nor red. In fact, what he looks like to you at the moment in this light is black. But to, in good light, he looks violet, purple, blue, with a bit of green, and that's got nothing to do with the pigment in the feathers. There is no blue or black pigment in those feathers at all. And what it is, it's created by a diffusion of sort of a, a different arrangements and crystals of melanin and air sacs within the feathers, within the barbs of the individual feathers. And each of those kind of combine to reflect light. They absorb light of a certain wavelength. Uh, so they absorb all the colors that aren't violet and blue and green, and then they release that violet and blue light, giving the impression that the bird is in fact blue. Isn't that amazing? There is actually one other, one other pigment, and that's a green pigment that only the Taracos or Luris here have. Otherwise, every parrot you've ever seen, every kind of iridescent love bird or budgie, that's all a trick of the light. It has nothing to do with the actual pigment of the feathers, which I think is very interesting indeed. Now here is Little Sook Dam. I'm not sure why I come here every day expecting there to be some kind of different result. Now, Cat and Tampa, you say that woodpecker was number 57 for you on the bird list. That's excellent news. Um, I, good. I think our, our record at the moment is about 200 species. That is pretty impressive, but 57, I think, is very good. Now, nothing going on here at Bifflesook Dam at all. We came here last night. There were some water thickenies flying about the place. The only thing I do want to show you, if we can go down into the water there, Dave, with the water, um, is that the green vegetation now, which was thriving here when there was a bit of moisture in the clay, is now starting to die off before any of the animals have actually managed to get in amongst the sharp clay to eat it. And that's a bit of a waste, it seems to me. Eventually, however, the remains of the organic material there will sink into the mud and it will be eaten by bacteria and various other things and eventually those will be eaten by slightly larger organisms and then when the rain comes back there'll be lots for the fishies to eat and from the distance you can hear the calls of the arrow marked babblers let us continue on our way Now, a very interesting question from Debbie in Vancouver. We're going to talk a lot about the drought over the coming months, of course. And Debbie, you want to know about whether or not the grass, which is now dormant or dead, it, it, it is in both cases, some of it's dead and some of it will be dormant and some of it will just exist purely in, in the seed bed. And you want to know if there are any other plants that are kind of surviving and thriving as a result of the lack of grass. Well. Yes and no. Debbie, there are one or two kind of pioneer plants that seem to be able to grow in very little uh, water, but they'll be very um, annual plants. They'll pop up, uh, they'll quickly bake their seeds and then disappear again. Now, these, here are these babblers. There are two flocks here. And they're having a fight. One to the right-hand side and one to the left. They're very cross with each other. This is obviously a territorial dispute. <laughs> they sound very cross indeed. I'm going to sneak forward and we'll try and actually get a view of them. Seems to be day of the babbler today. I can't actually see 
you need? I'll go put further, have you got one? No. Put further forward. And Debbie, the other thing that yeah, will survive in a, in a draft like this, or well, that does well in sort of low rain conditions compared with grass, they're all disappearing into the bush, would be the tree seedlings, Debbie. They, they do much better than grass. If there's a certain amount of water, I mean, beyond a certain, you know, a certain level, below a certain level, everything's going to suffer. But if there's a little bit of water, the tree seedlings tend to do very well because they have, can make a long route like that, which will go down eventually to the water table, whereas the grasses can't. They've got those short, adventitious roots, and they rely on surface water, which the trees don't. So the trees, you can, after a drought like this, in the absence of things like elephants, you can absolutely have a situation where clearings that you have suddenly sprout saplings, and they stop being clearings, and they become woodland. And that is actually happening on quarantine clearings. Watch out there, David. Watch out, everybody. That is a buffalo born. Zizi Fosipomocronata. We should always say Zizi Fos at least once a day. It's very good for the endorphins. Zizi Fos. And, of course, one of the advantages of a drought like this, as John has pointed out, is that the mosquito population, bearers of malaria and various other vile diseases, has a really struggled. So, John, I've hardly seen a mosquito since I got back from the holiday in January. So, yeah, absolutely, it makes a huge difference to the mosquito population. There's nowhere for them to breed. And for those of you who don't know, mosquitoes will breed in standing water. It doesn't have to be stagnant, but it does need to be standing. It can be a puddle, it can be your toilet system, it can be anywhere. But they do need that standing water in order to breathe. And without it, of course, they cannot breathe. There's a kudu, Dave. I don't know we'll be able to get a picture of it hidden. No, we won't. We don't even bother. It's hidden, hiding in the bush, a kudu cow through there. I just have a feeling let's get fairly cool on the game front today. Good. Now draw. You're in Berlin, of course, and you say you've only been watching for a week and you have already found a million reasons to come and visit. That's excellent news. And you say you might be coming out in September. September's a good time to come, I think. It can be a little bit harsh on the eye if you're not used to it, because there will be very little grass, there'll be very little leaves on the trees. But if you are just a little bit patient, your eye will adjust to it suddenly start to appreciate the incredible golden browns and greys that occur here and of course the game viewing in September with all the water concentrated around water holes is sublime. It's really good. You may lose our signal here. If you do, I apologize in advance. So far I think it's okay. And I don't think you've asked a question of us before, Brian, so it's very nice to hear from you. And you want to know about the newest species discovered in this area. Well, that is a very interesting question. I'm not sure that I can answer it, to be honest. Mammal-wise, I think every mammal that's here has, was described many, many years ago, probably at least 150 years ago. I don't think anything mammal-wise has probably been discovered or described since then. Birds, I don't know which one would have been the latest. Again, you know, this Kruger National Park doesn't actually have one endemic bird species, which is quite interesting. Endemic meaning only occurring in this area, which means that most of the species that do occur here would have been um, discovered before. I suspect quite strongly though, Brian, in fact, I know that there are a number of invertebrates, so that can be insects, it can be 
uh, spiders and scorpions and millipedes and snails and those sorts of things. There are a number of them that have been discovered not anywhere else, and they would have been the ones that are des described most lately. I think I heard of one being discovered and described in the late 90s. I think it was probably one of the last ones. But there will still be lots of invertebrates around here that we haven't described at all. And I mean, that's indicated by the field guides we have for the area. So you can get an insect field guide for this particular area and there are thousands of insects that you'll find on the trees or in the grass that are just not in the guide because they haven't been described yet which i think is very interesting thank you brian nice to hear from you all the way from glasgow now walt r buck in kentucky wonderful name, Walt R. Buck. Um, very appropriate for Kentucky, I imagine. And, oh, Walt R. Buck, yes, of course, Walt R. Buck. I've got it now. Well then, Kirsten, thank you for that. And if you, you want to know, I've forgotten entirely what you want to know. I was so impressed by your name. Hang on, it'll come back to me. Oh, carnivorous plants. Do we get any carnivorous plants here, Walt R. Buck? Uh, we don't, as far as I'm aware. Um, we get something called a carrion plant, which uh, smells like a carrion and it attracts flies to come and eat from it. But I think that's for pollination. I don't think it actually eats plants. Um, a horrible feeling um, unless there is one. And I think it, it, um, it holds water and the water then insects will drown in the water and it then eats, obviously digests those insects, but I can't for the life of me remember its name. We don't have anything like a Venus flytrap though, for example. Which must be a fascinating flower to see. Just looking up at a magpie shrike there. Now he's a bit hidden, we want to show that to you. We'll get seasick. Ah, look, we have large mammals there, Dave. Do you see them? Now, oh, these fellows, of course, let us down rather badly at the waterhole. They've been reliable, so reliable over the last little while. But of course, as it's cooled down, they've felt the need to move away from the foul, stinking pool, cesspool, that they and the hippo have created at Juma Dam. And they've come out here to graze on some relatively moist grass. And you can see they're re-chewing their lunch. Now, Gail, you are worried about the drought and you're interested in whether or not any of the animals will just stay and die, as you put it, or will the need to survive the survival instinct be so powerful that they will move to other areas where there isn't a drought. Gail, I'm not sure that that's the correct perspective to be looking at it. First of all, the instinct to survive in animals and indeed in human beings, because we are animals, is in exceptionally powerful. It doesn't change. And we will do anything, we and the animals out here will do anything to survive. It's a question of whether animals can move to an area that has no drought. So in the case of something like a warthog, it's just not possible. They're not designed to move very far. And so if the drought really takes hold and the water holes dry up, it doesn't matter how much they try, those piggies will die on their way to try to find water. So that's what happens there. Then in the case of species that can migrate, let's take our wonderful wildebeest herd, which has managed to raise all 10 babies so far and keep them out of the jaws of the Inkahuma pride. They could migrate away, but where would they go is the question. And as this drought takes hold, the entire Kruger National Park and the Limpopo Park and the Gonera Zoo in Zimbabwe, all of the rivers are drying up which means that there isn't anywhere for them to go. The only place they could maybe migrate to if there were no people here would be up into the mountains. But, I mean, there's a great swathe of people between here and the mountains 
and of course a fence on the western fringes of the Kruger. So Gail, while the instinct to survive and even the ability to go and find water might exist in some creatures like elephants and wildebeest, it is impossible for them to move out of this area because the drought is so widespread. Lovely question, thank you for that. And that buffalo is another prime example of an animal very dependent on water. So despite the fact that the water in the pan in which they've been living is so um, fetid, they are able to survive really well as long as they can drink. They can eat the driest, most nasty grass in the world and they look okay. And if we look at the one on the right there, Dave, if you look at his backside, he is not showing any signs of ill health whatsoever. His hips are not showing at all. He's in good condition. His coat is quite shiny. And that is not the case for the cattle outside. And it's not the case for some of the animals out here. The other animals, like some of the impala, are starting to look a bit ropey. Even the elephants are starting to look a bit skinny, a bit lean around the hips. These buffalo, I think, are doing remarkably well. Chewing, chewing, chewing endlessly. And Debbie, as you say, it is fascinating how the biosphere, the ecosystem will change as, uh, as the drought continues. And I like the fact that you use the term biosphere, which I, I mean, as far as I understand it, means all living creatures in this area. Now, this area doesn't just include the Kruger Park. I'm just going to drive along while we, I talk about this. The biosphere contains all of the wildlife, the Kruger, of course, and it includes the people outside the park. And the people outside the park are part of this biosphere here. They, too, are going to struggle immensely during the drought. They are not provided with water by our esteemed government. And so people are forced to go and, well, I mean, they are to a certain extent, they have to go to village taps, though. So there are long lines of people fetching water every day. And that's going to become increasingly difficult as this drought wears on. And it's equally going to become very difficult because a lot of their wealth is invested in cattle. Those cattle are going to start dying very soon indeed. And that will bring disaster to the biosphere, as you say. On the wilderness side of things, on this side of the fence, things will change. But as I've said before, it might be difficult to watch, but this area has coped with thousands and thousands of droughts over the millennia. And so it will be quite an interesting thing to watch. And I ask that all of you who are watching, don't, I try, I know it's going to be almost impossible if this drought does wear on, but try and remain semi-detached. I know that's impossible, but if you watch it semi-detached, it becomes a lot more fascinating than it does distressing. Yes, there are going to be times when it is a little bit distressing. But let's just keep our, try and keep positive about it. Okay, we're going to try and get past this, this tree here. Uh, while we do that, let's go across to Scott and catch up with him. So a few things have changed uh, since you've been gone, uh, one of which is uh, I've stopped in at one of the local fashionistas and got myself this fine garment. It's a poncho. It's a very fancy bit of gear, keeping us dry, and I think it's quite trendy. Liam's also wearing one, and maybe what we can do here is... There's my... Maybe what we can do. You can see also the VR rig on the front's also wearing one. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you exactly what the view of us or behind us looks like so you get an idea. There's VM. There you can see here the camera's covered up. He's got his poncho on. We've covered up everything behind us. There's also a funny kind of raincoat thing there. This. Um, so, yeah, there we go. There's the raincoats. I took a walk in the block and didn't find any sign of the Nkuma Clyde on foot. But I know a few other guys are continuing to work that area. And because we were an extra vehicle initially, um, I think now we should just move out of the area, give the guys some space to do the thing. And hopefully 
the three vehicles that are searching for them are going to successfully track them down. And then we'll simply jump onto the standby lineup and get our chance to view them. But in the meantime, we'll continue to peruse around Arethusa. I'm cautious to go too far west. Um, in this wet weather, even though it's a very fine drizzle, um, the moisture builds up quite quickly, and it's even building up quite quickly on the camera now. So we don't want to take any chances with the equipment. And that's why I'd rather stay a little bit closer towards Juma as opposed to going far west, which was the initial plan in the hope that we would find some sign of the Anderson male leopard. A brute of a leopard that I think we've only seen in some total three times. who's watching on YouTube. Um, sorry, Vian was just cleaning the lens there quickly, which is understandable as the drizzle builds up. Um, Mark, you would like to know if uh, the antelope like impala in this area will be similar to deer in that they'll lose condition during their rutting period because they'll only have one thing on their mind, and that is to fight off other males trying to increase the chances of them mating with females. Therefore, not feeding as much as they naturally would, not grooming themselves as much as they would, therefore allowing a greater parasite load to jump on board and have a free meal or an easy meal. And yes, most certainly, and that does in turn cause them to fall prey to predators, not only because their condition is, is, is weak, is, is kind of low, I think more so the fact that they're preoccupied fighting with one another, or chasing one another around, mating, a kind of a crazed state where they're not thinking about predators as much as they should be. So definitely, Mark, uh, well spotted and I wonder what predators are causing trouble for the deer in, in, in your area? Possibly um, some kind of a, maybe mountain lions or, I'm not sure, it's just be interesting to know uh, what predators are capitalizing on in the deer in your part of America. But that is also, like I said, a big reason why I was surprised this last rutting season that we went through that we didn't find more big male impala dangling from the branches of a marula tree having been caught and killed by the leopard it's usually a very common scene during the ruts as it is a common scene to see heavily pregnant females being caught in around october november december of all species you often see heavily pregnant females being caught and their fetuses being removed from their bellies we saw that quite a few times this uh, baby season a kudu with uh, quarantine, he killed an adult kudu, Karula killed an uh, impala that was about to give birth. <clears throat> so heavily pregnant females then have their chance to get attacked by the predators and then obviously once the babies get born then they are highly sought after. So it's kind of the males have their ch turn where they get uh, taken out, then the females, then the babies. attention on safari and would like to know why is it that there are not as many elephants around and it's a, a great question as well as an observation I can't tell you exactly why they've gone uh, it's most likely because they feel that they can acquire food elsewhere in better quantities than here the Savi Sands is, is, is a water rich area especially in comparison to other parts of the Kruger National Park which will not have as many man-made uh, water points as we do have here in the Sabi Sands. So essentially, I mean, it's a good reason why elephants would want to stay here. But obviously, you know, they've 
got message through the Bush Telegraph that there's some food right. elsewhere. Maybe some marulas are still in fruit further south of us, whereas here they are no longer fruiting. I can't be certain, but it is not uncommon for elephants to wander huge distances. They're not territorial. They will move wherever their bellies suggest that they go. So this is the boundary between Juma and Arethusa. Again, I'm just staying in the general area of where these lions could pop up. It could be anywhere here. And on top of that, we could also bump into Shadow, or Leopardess, or Tingana, a big male. Um, let's have a again if you guys want to come in. Um, still heading so Hi there, Bill Burkett. You would like to know if rain is coming during our winters, and technically no. Uh, South Africa as an entire, it was a country, has got a mainly uh, a summer rainfall pattern, except for the Cape region. That has a Mediterranean climate with uh, winter rainfall. So no, typically our, some, our winters, especially here in the low part, are beautiful, cloudless skies. Every day is hot and sunny. Where you'll, it'll be cold in the morning and in the evening. So if you're on safari, you'll have beanies, gloves, jackets. But as the morning progresses, you'll start peeling off the layers. And by the time you get back to the camp, you'll probably only be wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And then beautiful, warm, sunny days, cloudless skies. Uh, winters are absolutely marvelous out here. Great weather. But it's our summers that are less predictable with regards to weather. It's supposed to be lots of heavy thunderstorms and rainfall amounting to about 500 to 600 mils of rainfall is what we should receive in this area each year. But that was not the case last summer and it's certainly not the case this summer. I think last summer we maybe got 250 or 300 mils and this uh, summer so far we've only got 100. So we are clearly experiencing uh, the results thereof after having no rain. Uh, because this is a boundary road, <coughs> civilian vehicles can drive along it to and from lodges. I'm not too sure who this could be. That will just pull over and hit them pass. Nice car. Oh, one, of the, one day when I grow up, I'll get one of those, maybe. And a lot of traffic today. Aren't we in luck? Ayer, Ayer, Ayer means kind of it's just a general greeting. Hello, almost. And but means brother. So I just said, hello, brother. Never seen him before. He's from a lodge further to the south where we, we don't go and I've never actually been before. He's got a bit he's got a bit of a drive ahead of him in the rain. Hello to Deborah. You would like to know if hyenas numbers increase to a point where there are too many. I'm not sure at what point that would be. Um, but if there were just an abundance of hyenas and they were causing trouble for the lion and the leopard, would we intervene? Well I, I hope not, but in this day and age, you'll never know what happens. And um, again, yes, I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, not, <laughs> it's not my land to decide how it should be managed. But technically, and I hope no, that it, 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 there wouldn't be any intervention by landowners. Um, and I'm pretty certain that they wouldn't. And you know, it's, it's not uncommon to have droughts. There have been droughts for um, <clears throat> many, many centuries, probably since the Earth began, there have been droughts. In this area, it's kind of on average every 10 years there appears to be a drought. On average, the last one was in 2002, so it was 14 years ago. And the reason 
reason why I'm talking about the droughts is that the drought may have a positive impact on hyena. It's going to be a time of plenty for them. Lots of animals dying, lots of easy meals. All of the predators will be succeeding up to a point. Obviously, I mean, it, it'll get to a point where there may be no more prey for them once all the herbivores have died. But initially, it will mean a time of plenty, not only for hyena, but also for leopard and for lion. But let's say that the hyena do benefit the most from that. Well, you know, maybe that's Mother Nature's plan. And it's the turn for hyenas' population to, to increase and for the other predators, therefore, populations to decrease. And, you know, there's always going to be a natural ebb and flow, uh, peaks and troughs for all different populations of animals, and it's, it's a necessity in a way. But the bottom line is I hope that nobody would interfere because uh, I don't think we know enough about the history and, and even though management is required to a degree because there are fences around the Kruger National Park, even though it is massive, some degree of intervention possibly can be justified. But then again, you know, there hasn't been enough research for hundreds of years to know what populations should be at any given moment. And the same goes for elephant, for, for, for all the, the animals that have a big impact on the other species around them. And I guess, uh, as a general rule, Deborah, the only time people intervene is when endangered animals are at risk. But that is just a general rule. And again, it will always depend on the individual property, who owns it, and what their thoughts are, I guess, on what is right and what is wrong. Wunderbar. Well, we are still hoping that these Inkahuma ladies are going to pack their heads up. We're still in this area, just crisscrossing around, and we're going to stay here until hopefully somebody finds him. But for now, you guys are going to be going across for a change of scenery with James. Poncho? I'm astounded Scott's taken it upon himself to put a poncho on. I'm a rather enjoying the fact that it's just a bit moist on the skin. I feel like I've been cooked like a piece of steak on the barbecue or braai, depending on where you're from in the world. And so I'm quite enjoying the slight feeling of moisture, aren't you, David? Yes, pleasant. We haven't found any animals, though, which means that it says to me the animals are not enjoying it quite so much. And um, Scott's luck would seem to bear that out at the moment. We are heading now towards Treehouse Waterhole, which is just the other side of this little section of drainage lines. Not much going on, not much in the way of sound, but there's a lovely feeling about the bush with this water coming out of the sky. It's really quite nice. Now, Ronald, a wonderful question. You're on YouTube, you're a new viewer, so welcome and thank you very much for talking to us. Ronald, you want to know, is there a migrating pattern out here of animals? Do the animals migrate like they do in other parts of Africa? Ronald, they don't, you know, and it's because of us people. We've put in fake water holes, or not fake water holes, artificial water holes, dams and pans, we pump them and that has stopped the movement of animals in this area and also the number of people that live in the area has also stopped it. Uh, if you want to put on the cover you must just shout. Okay. Um, Ronald, I don't mean you, I know that you don't know whether we should put the cover on or not at this stage. Uh, well, what used to happen in this area, Ronald, is that things like wildebeest would go down to the sand river during the winter months, it's a perennial river normally, and then in the summer they'd migrate up to the Timbavati river, which is an annual river, and they'd kind of make that seasonal migration. I think there are a couple of other similar movements around the Kruger Park. And then, of course, in prehistory before, there were swathes of people living in this area. The elephants would move into this area probably during the winter, uh, when? No, during the summer months, then they'd go up into the mountains where it's a bit wetter for the winter time. And that, so there certainly used to be animal migrations in this area. At the moment, though, we know we put dams all over the place, especially in the Sabi Sands. You can't actually get more than two and a half kilometers from water in the Sabi Sands. Right? Nice question. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Now, Pamela, you want to know if an elephant caught in a dreadful drought out here might try and migrate all the way to Kenya or Tanzania. Is that a bird sitting on top of the termite mound? Pamela, it wouldn't really be possible, you know. No, it's not. It's just a piece of termite mound. 
What a wonderful spotter of game I am. Um, Pamela, because of the state of things here, I think we might actually have to start putting on some rain yep. equipment here. Um, Pamela, we're going to start putting on some rain equipment onto the camera. Um, you want to know about whether or not... So an, an elephant wouldn't be able to get there because it would hit a fence. It would hit farmland, it would hit an international border. So there isn't a contiguous um, corridor that it could get to East Africa on. So no, Pamela, an elephant wouldn't come across here. I think we're going to have to hand over to Scott if we can. Um, Kirsty, if that's all right, we just need to put on some rain covers for the camera and stuff. Is that all right, Kirsten? Right, let's go across to Scott and we'll catch up with you when we have waterproofed ourselves. Welcome back to the wet safari yep. here. And I'm loving every little bit of moisture we're getting, even though it is impacting ever so slightly so far on the safari. It could get to a point that it does impact completely, and we have a couple of quits. But for now, it's just so pleasant to be out in the rain. I thoroughly enjoy it, especially after the heat and dry weather that we've been experiencing. Oh, Astralina. This is ambitious. I wouldn't call this rain. This is drizzle. Um, and I don't think you're going to hear anything. I'm wondering how VM could possibly try and show you how fine the drizzle is. It's going to be incredibly difficult. I wonder if it's going to help us shine a, a light through the lens. No. Let me just keep dead still. Maybe you can just hear a very silent as the raindrops fall onto my Gucci poncho. Versace, I mean. <laughs> oh, it's getting stronger. You'll be able to hear this. Oh, yeah. Here we go. That's better. <laughs> Uh-oh. This is the strongest it's been all day. So, Andrelina, well, it's your blessing and your command that has caused Mother Nature to start dumping the rain down more furiously, and that is exactly what the Saudi Sands means. Not us so much. Um, Sabi Sands, what is this? Good. I just need to find the immobilizer for the car. Now, a lot of you may ask the question as to why we need an immobilizer, Archer. We don't. It's just incredibly difficult to remove, I'm told. Again, even that in itself is hard to believe, but... Apparently... Apparently, there's no joy there. I've got some good news. Cedric's just found the line tracks crossing into Juma. And look at this whole vehicle's all got their Versace ponchos on. They're all in shopping together. Except for Sid, he doesn't have a Versace poncho. He's got a different label. <laughs> How's it, Sid? How are you doing? Hello, everyone. Nice outfits. <laughs> Batman suit. <laughs> <laughs> and across straight to uh, behind us. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you yeah. so much, Seth. Sorry. No, no. I'm yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Just a little guiding, joking banter there. He's like, I'm just going to go in here. He's, he's sadly not allowed on to Juma. Um, so we were just pretending, and that's why I said I won't tell anyone. And traversing agreements are there for a reason. And it looks like we are going to find some tracks over here. I can't see any, actually, but let's hope that I at least see one or two to show you. But the good news is they've come on to Juma. Where did they cross? Can you put the dash cover on? Yes, I can. There you go. You got them there? Yeah. They must found some tracks there. There's a lot of vehicles that have been driving up and down there. 
it's uh, difficult to see on this side at least. But the good news is, the VM has found one of the tracks. Do you think you'll be able to get them on camera, VM, or is it not too clear? Oh, uh, there we go. There you can see faintly some lion tracks. And that's awesome. Let's now try and find out where exactly they are on Juma. But I'm going to need to put on the dashboard cover quickly. Don't worry, everyone. The rain covers are being redesigned into a more effective uh, solution. I'm not sure if there's any, even any Velcro on the front of this car, then. That's your dirt. Okay, so the line's crossed in here. Now we need to loop around and see if we can't find where exactly they have gone. If we, we, we're probably going to drive around the block. If I don't have any luck with the tracks coming out on the other side, then I'm going to have to jump off the vehicle and go walking in here. But let's just do a quick loop around. See if we don't get lucky, and then find them after we've looped ahead of them. And then we will reconsider and recalculate the plans. It's impossible to drive off-road hoping to find animals. Uh, not impossible, but it's just not a clever way of going about it. Darlene in New Hampshire, are you interested to know how much you'll be helping with regards to conservation and community development uh, if you do come and stay at a lodge? Um, and it all depends on which lodge you go to. I guess like anything in life, uh, there'll be varying degrees of everything. You know, in, in different industries, or within one industry, but within different people within that industry, or different companies within the same industry. So, um, I guess you've just got to do some research into which camps really do help the surrounding communities, because um, not necessarily all of them will help as much as others. But the bottom line is, every single camp that you go to um, is helping preserve a wilderness area and generally employ staff from surrounding areas to work there, so thus creates employment. And therefore, yes, regardless of which camp you go to, you are going to be helping with conservation and community development. But like I say, there's going to be varying degrees thereof, depending on where exactly you may be going. I strongly suggest coming out on safari. It's such an awesome experience. Of course, you're getting some great tastes of what it's like by joining us. But obviously, being here in the flesh is somewhat different. We're going to continue focusing our efforts on trying to find these lines. And while we do, you guys are going to jump back onto James's vehicle. Hello everybody again, we've covered ourselves in rain equipment at the moment, exciting news about the lion tracks, we're going to head in that direction, see if we can't give Scott a hand, and we'll see what happens. This is just wonderful, I feel the gentle pitter patter of rain on the head, I feel it on the skin, I have put on some rain equipment as you can see, and we've put on our fancy little uh, rain cover on the dashboard here, and now we will try and see if we can help Scott find those lions. I'm just going to get an update from him. Scott? Scott, I'm on Philemon's cut line. Where would you like me to check? Um, come on, so he's James. Um, I guess it's the best bet up towards Valenites, and I might go back to the last tracks then and uh, take a short walk. Okay, copy, thanks. 
So, Scott is over there in that direction. He's coming towards this area. We think the lions are coming this way. We're not sure. He lost the tracks coming into the block, as he would have told you. So we're going to head round and head towards there, and we'll see what happens. You heard him say he might go to the last tracks and head off on foot. Gracie in um, in Ohio you you say you're as excited as, as, if, as if it was Christmas well, that's because you're going home tomorrow and waiting for you at home of course it's Barry James for those of you who don't know is a um, a mud doll made of Bufflesook Dam just after well when was it, it was probably a few weeks ago and you find that there, sorry. And Gracie, you're going home and you say you're going to have to make some clothes for him because it's much colder there in Ohio than it is here. Yes, you will have to definitely make him some clothes. He's also not very strong, Gracie. He's had a long trip over there to the United States, so you will have to be very gentle with him and definitely give him some clothes. <laughs> tell, us how, tell us how the meeting goes. Now, tracking in this is not ideal because it will start to leave a crust upon the soil, but if you can get it just right, the lions will break that crust, especially after just a little bit of rain like this, so it becomes very easy to age the tracks as the lions are moving now. Now, I know that they went into some bambili earlier today, which I'm sure Scott told you, and because it's been a cool day and there's now some rain, of course, which makes it even cooler than it would be otherwise, they could well be moving during the day, and if they haven't eaten, they're probably quite hungry. They could be quite pleased to try and find something to eat. So that is David's hand wiping the lens, of course. That is highly necessary when you're driving into a thick scotch mist, which is in fact what we're doing now. Keeping an eye out for the tawny shape and color of a lion. Kathy, you're obviously a regular watcher all the way from Florida, and you want to know if we've seen Scrapper recently. Now, for those of you who don't know, Scrapper is the name given to uh, one of the Birmingham boys by our viewers, and Scrapper uh, looks is called Scrapper because he looks um, he looks a bit like uh, I don't know if you've seen that movie Snatch uh, with Brad Pitt in it. He looks a bit like the Pikey version of. Um, of the lion world, he's a fighter, he's got some scars on his face, and that's why he's called Scrapper. We haven't seen him, Kathy. I haven't seen the Birmingham boys probably for three months. They haven't bothered to come up here to protect this particular section of their territory, and I think that's because they don't feel any pressure from the males in the north or the males to the west of us. So I haven't seen them for a long time. I'm sure he's still with them. Um, he seemed to be a very strong part of the coalition. I think it has fragmented slightly. I don't know when the last time all five of them were seen together. It was, it was just, it, the last few times I've heard of them, it was just before. So I think the slightly older one, there was an older one with them. And I think he's probably fallen by the wayside. Feel the wet rain on my face. Last time we saw the Investec pack was a little while back, but yes, all the pups were still alive. So I don't know why the signal's bad here. It shouldn't be. It's not normally like this. It may have something to do with the weather. I'm not sure. There's a dike here. 
He's just standing on the road. He doesn't know we've seen him. On a day like today, you must stop for everything you possibly can because things are thin on the ground. Right, she's gone, obviously. And then the last pack of dogs we saw was the Sands Pack. And the Sands Pack, I, they were, as far as I remember, eight adults and seven youngsters by the last count. And they, well, that's what they are now. And the number of pups at the beginning of their, of their litter. And it's amazing. Of just three adults, they lost an adult. One of the females, I think to a snake bite, we think. And raise those puppies. Really impressed with them. It's very odd on the back screen. What's going, on? What's going on? Sorry, Kirst, I spoke over you there. Um, are, are we live? Have you got a picture? Um, okay. So Scotty is off the vehicle at the moment. He's tracking in this block over here. So with any luck, we will either see the lions going across here, or he will walk into them in the bush. And don't worry for his safety, he will be absolutely fine. You know, he's a very big, intimidating-looking fellow. The lions will be afraid of him. And I was just talking about that experience we had with the Investec pack on foot the other day. Andrew and I were sat on the road, and they just came running down the road. Scott was behind them in the vehicle, and it was the most fantastic experience. They came to within three meters of us. And they're the best things to look at on foot. I mean, uh, wild dogs and cheetah both, if you can get them habituated enough. They don't see us as prey and they're not that afraid of us. So while they will keep their distance, they're certainly not, um, they'll just get on with life. So you can be with them on foot if you can keep up with them. And it is just it's the most special experience in the world. I'd love to see some dogs now. They're certainly my favorite of the animals when we get up here. Excuse me, fiddling with my ear the whole time. It's just making sure that my earpiece is in with my ear. Given that the rain is now lubricating everything. You want to know what we like to be called? A guide, a ranger, a TV presenter, a TV personality, a person who loves their job too much. Donna, I like to be called um, James of the Wilderness. I find that that is a, a title fitting my exalted station in life. And of course, I'm now an enormous celebrity here on the internet. I have at least uh, 25 Facebook followers, which is excellent. So, Donna, you know, you can call me James of the Wilderness if you like. In, in actuality, Donna, we prefer to be called, uh, well, I don't know, it depends on the guy. So, uh, the jobs that we did before were largely to do with guiding. So, as we say that, a guide is coming past us now. Now we used to call what Aubrey's doing there ranging and it's not actually ranging, it's guiding, that's what it is. Now what we do is not ranging. A ranger is somebody who takes care of the wilderness, who does the land management, looks after the roads, looks after the animals. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Okay. All righty. Okay. Enjoy. So I've now lost my mobilizer. So that's Aubrey. He's from Juma, and he is a guide, a ranger like us.
more somebody who looks after the wilderness. I think you can pull that to whatever you like, to be honest. I think um, people who love their jobs too much is probably a particularly good thing to pull as Donna, yes. But presenter, I guess, would be the job description. Somebody said, what is your job? I think I'd say it was a presenter, I wouldn't say it was a guy. A bit of both, obviously. Spotted a uh, skin walk. David, you don't seem particularly impressed with that spotted skin. You see the skin book from there? It's that very unimpressive looking brown thing in the middle of the bush there, about 100 meters away. If you zoom in there, you'll see it. Left a bit. Left a bit. Left a bit more. Left quite a lot. There we go. Zoom in there. See him. Uh, just material. Oh, there he goes. Well done. <laughs> now I'm rather hoping the vines will materialize. So I'm just stopping here. Just stopping here to have a listen, simply because we don't want to miss the alarm calls that might happen. There are impala in this area. So we're just going to, let's listen for 20 seconds, and it's an interesting afternoon. So the sounds that we've been hearing during the courses of the afternoon will be very different from those that we're hearing now. Let's have a listen for the next 20 seconds. I suppose the only thing that you can hear really is the wind. No birds calling, no alarm calling, a strong wind blowing from the southeast. And normally, of course, in this kind of weather, all you want to do is go home and be inside. But oh, it's so wonderful having weather like this. Right, we'll keep looking around here. I think it's quite encouraging. Aubrey's gone down the same road, and I think Scott is in this block where that steering book was. It is a very large block, so that those lines could be anywhere inside the block. We're going to drive around here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I swallowed the frog. We're going to go along the road here and turn down towards what is known as the Gari Repeater, and that's where a lot of the... There's a little road that goes in there. Oh, hang on here, what? Go ahead, Aubrey. Coffee, thank you. He, <laughs> Aubrey spotted the lions on the road we just drove along. <laughs> that means I drove straight past them, everyone. That's not very good at all. It is difficult, in my defence, to um, to look you in the eye and spot animals. <laughs> Very poor. Sorry about that. What we'll do is we'll go in and we'll establish the sighting and then because Scott's been looking for them, he can come over here and have a look and see and then we'll go to the hyena then. Second, Nancy in Texas. I will talk to you now. I'm just listening to Aubrey. Um, Nancy. Oh, there, lion running across the road. Yeah, just in there. These are not the same ones that Aubrey's got here. There, look, there's the lioness. Okay. 
Orbs, we've got one lioness here further north of your position now running down south to the block. Hold on everybody, sorry about the noise. Confirm court. Okay, apparently they're chasing some wildebeest. Gonna get very thick in here. She's still running through there. I can see her. Okay. Don't worry about the trees that we are running over at the moment. They're an encroacher species called Strychnos madagascarensis. There, there's some impart. Uh, you can hear maybe some zebra alarm calling. You probably can't hear anything. They've caught a zebra. It sounds like. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. David, you're still there. Yeah. Sounds like they've caught a zebra in here. Oh, we're not going to get through that way. That's a dead tree. Oh, it's just going into the position. I was following that line. It's through the bush. Watch your heads, everyone. Hole here dug by, in fact, an old warren of holes there dug by an art park. Aubrey, you got in. Find out if Aubrey can still see them. They haven't caught anything. They're just crossing the road here, still heading south. They might cross out of the road now. We're quite close to the southern boundary. <laughs> Sorry about this. And I promise you the noise that you're hearing is a lot worse than it is in real life. Well, we are in real life. Scott is still off the vehicle tracking. Right, they came running across here. I heard the zebra going, whoop, 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 whoop. That's what they do when they're alarmed. You can see there, something's been running across the, the road. Aubrey's in front of us there, so we're gonna try and catch up with him there. They're definitely trying to kill. Got visual there? Oh, they've killed. You hear something alarming. Oh, come on, you silly car. I can't get the car over this. Yeah, I got the Just for all of you who perhaps this is going to be difficult to watch, I know it's hard, I know it's not nice. These lions have to eat. And I, although there is a very distressing sound coming out of the zebra, it won't be feeling anything, it will be in complete shock. going to be silent.
Okay, it's dead everyone. I think it's dead now. No, it's not. I know this is very, very difficult to watch. I'm just going to be quiet. Let's see what happens here and then we'll talk about it afterwards. That is the alarm of the rest of the zebra herd. They're obviously still quite traumatized. Cat, you want to know why they don't kill it? Cat, one of them does have its mouth crushing the windpipe. They don't think like that cat. They think in terms of here is food, let us eat it now. They don't think let's kill it first. It's not making a noise anymore. As it was making a noise, she clamped her mouth over its windpipe. That's a lioness at the far end there. I think it's dead now. This is the most raw that you will ever see the wilderness. Hmm. You can hear them fighting with each other. That growling is not growling at the living thing. It is them growling at each other. This is a zebra foal, it's a youngster. I don't believe it's more than maybe two or three months old. The zebras are coming closer. They're just trying to investigate where the lions are. They're not going to try and defend this hapless foal now. Donna, you want to know which parts of this zebra they'll eat first? A little zebra like this with all five lions, they'll have at it at every angle they can. And you'll see that three of them, though, have gone for the soft underbelly. So that's normally the first thing that an animal will try and get hold that the cats will try and get hold of. I think that that leg kicking there, everyone, is, is just nerve response now. You can see this is the lioness that was at the head. She's the one who took the responsibility to clamp the windpipe shut. The zebra is now dead. And Mark, as you say, what a brilliant observation. You say that the choker is normally the last one to eat. That's exactly what's happened here. The choker has come round to the back to try and get at the good meat at the hind end and she is the last to eat. Now, this is going to get pretty gory, I must just warn you everyone, but there is no pain being felt by that zebra anymore. It is dead, and this is the rawest you'll ever see the wilderness. 
and I don't know, I'd love to know how it made you feel. So send through in three words, if you wouldn't mind. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Tell us in three words how seeing the life suffocated out of that zebra made you feel. I have my own feelings, and um, I'm sure you will have yours. But it is a profound experience to me to have, to see the life of something snuffed out like that. Hello, Mike in Florida and Jaguar. You want to know if the other guides saw the takedown? No, they didn't see the takedown. They just heard the alarm call. Aubrey spotted them, the first ones, then we spotted the second one. We followed her through the block there, and he saw them chase the zebra. He didn't see it, them actually kill. What an experience. Of course, other than the zebra, we should feel sorry for Scott, who's actually tracking them. Right. Ooh. How'd that make you feel, Dave? I'm coming. Now, rock and rolly, you had a sighting of five lions yesterday, the Inkohuma Pride. Yes, this is the Inkohuma Pride. In this, I'm very much mistaken. But this is the Inkohuma Pride five lionesses and they're now in a feeding frenzy. The zebra will not last for the next hour. It's amazing how when that life is gone, how the the sense of stress dissipates and we're into a sense of wonder at the strength and power of these lions. And that blood-curdling growl that they give to each other is just quite something. Now look at this, Boyd, this is asked, answering your question. Boyd, you want to know, you're in North Carolina and you want to know if lions will eat at leisure or do they eat as fast as they can in order to kind of finish the kill before something can come and steal it. Boyd, they will kill and then eat as fast as possible. But if it is a big animal like a buffalo or a giraffe, they will not be able to eat it all at once. And so they hear yeah. other zebra's alarm calling behind us. And so they will eat it until they are stuffed full, then they will lie on either side of the kill and then come back and feed periodically. Buffalo can last three days, giraffe four or five days. The zebra's not going to last, I don't think, the next hour or two. You can see they're absolutely voraciously eating it. They are, all of the internal organs are already finished. The stomach has been finished. You saw that come out. There's a real smell of innards around here at the moment. Whew. Now, Brian in Toronto, you want to know if it's true or not that the trauma that is apparent when we look at something like this is not as bad for the animal being killed as it does actually look. Brian, I think that is the case. We are, as mammals, are programmed to go into shock. Adrenaline courses through our bodies. Our kind of instinctual brain takes over. We stop feeling. We get tremendous strength boost. Same happens with human beings in conflict situations if they're in a, in a battle. And I think it's exactly the same. The only kind of kicker to that would be to say that 
once the animal is down and it's not um, it's not dead yet of obviously the adrenal gland cannot keep producing adrenaline and if it doesn't die quickly then I'm sure that there is an element of pain but of course it doesn't remember that pain at all that's probably only a minute or two and if the pain becomes too great of course the animal will just pass out What a wonderful three words from Lucy in South Bend in Indiana. You say sad, death, life. Yes, brilliant. I think that's an excellent way of putting it, Lucy. I definitely feel a sense of sadness. And there we go, Robin, circle of life, absolutely. And I've, I'm sure, I'm no doubt, all of you now are not feeling anything like the way you were when we stopped here. Traumatic to watch the actual death, but now it's five predators feeding on their well-earned, hard-earned kill. Now, Vicky, a good question. It's a small zebra, probably weighing in at roughly, mm, let's say, 60 kilograms or so. And, Vicky, that's not big. Oh, how many pounds is that? That's probably about 140 pounds. You want to know if they will kill again after this? Will they hunt again or will they go and rest? Vicky, they will most certainly have a rest. If, however, something was to come past here, they would almost unquestionably take it down if it didn't look like it was going to be too much effort. Now there is a hyena apparently making its way here. We won't turn the camera to it just yet. It was spotted by Brent Leo Smith who is in fact guiding some guests today from Juma. He got so excited. So one hyena is going to really struggle to try and kind of take out these lions. Is certainly not going to manage to frighten off five lionesses. So I'll keep an eye out. As soon as we, as soon as we get a view, we will show you. <laughs> And Brian, you say brutal, sad, and necessary. Brilliant. And Manzi, you say tears, tears, tears. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely an element of that. I felt, I felt, I always feel quite traumatized when I see these things. We'll just keep looking behind us for the hyena. Let me take my jacket off after that hair raising drive through the bush. And the air now, of course, is filled with a totally different scent. So where we were smelling the petrichor, the lovely smell of wetted earth before, we are now into the space where we're smelling guts, basically undigested plant material, which is not the most pleasant smell in the world. But isn't this amazing? What an absolutely astonishing privilege to be able to have witnessed this thing today. This is your first kill, though. First. David's first kill. I mean, this kill will definitely go quite far for them. It will um, it'll satisfy them for a day or two. Whether they will choose to kill or not again will very much depend on the opportunities that present itself and, of course, the weather. We don't often see lions, of course, killing during the day. It hardly ever happens like that. 
and then when you do see it, it's just a real pleasure. Because normally it's done under cover of darkness, except on a day like this where the wind is blowing, they're difficult to smell. And so the predator prey are always a little bit weary. It's why we're not, we haven't seen a lot of animals today. We've been driving around, the wind has been rustling through the leaves, the rain is damping any smells, and so the lions will hunt. They know that the herbivores are at a disadvantage. You can hear the crunching now of flesh and bone. Now, Erin in Michigan, I, you ask a fascinating question that the textbooks will t explain exactly the way you have that the lions will go for the organs first because they are the most nutritious. I think the softness of the underbelly certainly lends itself to the first axis. The organs are full of nutrition. They're also full of fat. Now remember that a fat, fat is a nutrient in very short supply out here. And it's necessary, it's, it's a good nutrient for something like a lion to produce energy from. And so Yes, the organs are an excellent one to go for first. Now, the only th reason I am saying this with a little bit of sort of hesitation is that a cheetah, which has the most trouble getting into an uh, into a carcass, it's got smaller teeth, it has to eat the fastest, will go in through the backside. They will always eat out the back end first. They will try and eat the rich meat in the hind quarters first. I'm just hearing some rustling in the leaves. Thinking maybe the hyena is approaching, but it isn't. So yeah, I think it is. I think it's a bit of both. I think it's because of the um, because of the nutrition and the access to get in. Now, Sean, you're in Secunda, <coughs> and you want to know if this. These conditions are perfect hunting conditions. I think I'd say they're slightly sub-perfect. This sort of atmosphere, wind, rain at night would be even better for them, but they will take the opportunity during the day like this. They obviously sensed that there was some zebra downwind of them. They knew they wouldn't be picked up on the wind, and they knew that with the wind blowing through the trees like this, they had a very good chance. Now I just want to give you a sense of the scale of these animals. These are not small animals. These are bigger than any dog you've ever seen in your life before. They are bigger than obviously than any cat you've ever seen before. And we're looking at these adult females sitting at about 120 kilograms. That's about 260 pounds. That is an enormous animal. It is built for strength, for hunting, for speed and for fighting, which means that it is an immensely, immensely powerful animal. Five of them the zebra foal would have stood no chance whatsoever. Now that crunching sound that you can hear is not the so much those great big sharp canines which would have been used to do the initial damage. It's the carnassial teeth, it's the molars which are like sharp edged blades slicing the meat off the bone and off the skin. <clears throat> and that's what that crunching sound you can hear is. And I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there's complete silence from the other two vehicles next to us. Everybody is overcome by the incredible nature of what we've seen here. perhaps approaching. The hyenas, of course, renowned for their ability to eat bones. And Jen, you're in Minnesota, you all know if the lions will eat some of the bones. Um, they will eat some of them, yes. I think the large femur and perhaps the front shoulder bones they won't eat. 
they won't eat the hips, I don't think, but they will eat the smaller bones, definitely. The only reason they don't eat all the bones is they don't really have the teeth for it, or the jaw muscles like a hyena does. The hyenas will get something from this. Now, a hyena who has come across this, they're incredibly patient, will normally just lie off in the distance, keep a safe distance from them, and then as soon as they disappear off to go and have a drink, or perhaps they decide they've had enough of this kill, he'll sneak in and eat the rest of the bone. And what he'll be going for also, very fat-rich, nutrient-rich section, the middle of the bone, the bone marrow, and that is what the lions will struggle to get at. Gracie, aged just eight in Ohio, you say you had to turn it off for a little while at the beginning, but now it's fine. One zebra feeds five lions, it's necessary, and the zebra is now playing in heaven. Well, I hope it is, Zebria, um, Gracie. I think that's a really nice thought. I also think that there are many people, not just you, Gracie, and lots of adults, who will feel exactly the same, where even if they did watch that the zebra dying, the feeling that they have now will be very different from the feeling they had as the life was unfortunately being removed from the zebra. It's very difficult to watch, but now, as you say, it's fine. It just looks like some lions having a meal. Hmm. you're in British Columbia, your three words for the scene, nature's awful symmetry. Yep. Very nice. Very nice way to look at it. It's a quote that I often try and remember the exact words to, which I never can, to my eternal discredit. But I heard David White say it once, and I think it comes from a Native American um, sort of uh, chieftain's speech and he says or he's talking to a youngster about being lost in the forest and he talks about the fact that the wilderness will kill you just as soon as it will save you so the wilderness looks on us and looks on all of the animals here with a kind of um, what should we say what's the word I'm searching for with an indifference. We are all part of the wilderness, these lions, the zebra and us. And so while we draw tremendous strength from the wilderness, it is well to remember, of course, and that is why we love it so much, that it will save us just as soon as it will kill us. I do feel sorry for poor old Spot, of course. I wonder if he's back on the vehicle. He must be thrashing his head against the steering wheel at this stage. Hmm. Now, Boyd, you're in North Carolina, you say, one zebra feeds five lions. Nature's, I think, what did you call it? You called it nature's perfect form. Absolutely. And you, Sorry, nature at its purest, yes. Wilderness at its most pure and most raw. Now, Boyd, you also want to know if lions have a favorite food. No, but they do specialize. Some prides will specialize. This pride normally eats them. Um, I've seen them eat a baby zebra, in fact, in this exact area before. But they will also eat buffalo. And this pride is particularly good at killing buffalo. And possibly less so since they lost their old chum, Junior, who was a young male who lived with them and is now absconded in order to avoid the attentions of the Birmingham boys. 
But yes, prines don't necessarily have a favorite food taste-wise, but they will certainly often specialize. Quite amazing. I'm just going to try and get hold of Scott. I'm not sure where he is. So I think it might be well to hand over the sighting to him, given that he was tracking them. Scott, do you copy Scott? Mr. James? Scott, I'm sure you've had the update. Um, if you would like to take over here, please pull in at any time. Thanks very much, James, uh, but I'm, I'm happy. Let's carry on. Yeah, Scott says he's happy. I think he's being kind. Oh well, luck of the draw. Now, Susan in New York, in Long Island, New York, as we watch the lions devouring bits and pieces of this zebra, you want to know if there is anything that they will not eat of the zebra. Yes, there is. They will avoid eating the uh, hooves. They are totally indigestible. And even hyenas can't digest hooves. They'll eat them, but often they'll come out almost intact out the other end, which must be a deeply painful experience. And the hair is also indigestible, so while they will no doubt eat some of it, uh, they will probably leave quite a lot of the skin behind. So the skin and the hooves they will probably leave. But the rest will be swallowed gratefully. I'm just going to tell you what, I'm going to sneak a little bit forward and see if we can't get a slightly different angle, just for the sake of it, just so that you can see a little bit more feeding. Let's go across to Scott while I move the car. He's got something interesting to show you. Hello everyone, and we're just playing around here with this little device, selfie stick, pow, and there's a little feed coming through to my phone. There's a slight delay, as you would have noticed. Um, oops, not, not a very good cameraman. That's why VM rushed out of there. Awesome stuff with the lion, and well done to you and James for racing into that action as quickly as you did. I know some of the images initially might have been quite difficult, but it is nature, and you must consider yourselves lucky to be a part of that action. It doesn't happen often. So I'm going to take you to show you a nest of a red-breasted swallow. They're a monogamous couple that live in this area, and we saw them perching on this buffalo thorn tree earlier, and I finally pieced together the puzzle that they will be nesting in this road culvert. They often nest in road culverts which is basically a pipe underneath the road, and I'm going to take you along to go and see it now. Cool. So, what's interesting is that they prefer to nest in these road culverts as opposed to any other place. So, if there wasn't these man-made structures where they would nest as under logs or in termite mounds, that would be a good place. But they have got this incredible ability to build these wonderful kind of upside-down igloos, you could say. And you guys are going to have a look at that right now. Well, there might be a light, slight delay on the, on the camera, but you should be getting some great views of this mud nest attached to the roof of this culvert. And let me just take it out to give you the full perspective. It's about two feet in, and yes, Ron, you yes, can Ron. see the long very narrow entrance hole there, where they'll probably have about four eggs somewhere in there. They can have three to six eggs on average and often will have two clutches in a season. Yes, Ryan. Yes, Ryan. And, oh, shouldn't have switched off the light there. Um, 
Isn't that wonderful? Every day we drive over their nests. I mean, fascinating stuff in the middle of the road, and that's their favorite spot. I'll show you the birds quickly now, so you get an idea of what they are, or what they look like, but I'll need my mobile device for that. Red-breasted swallow, very, very colorful swallow as far as they go. One of my favorites, I guess. Right here. Oh, they've arrived. No ways. Perfect. Hard to see in the light. Beautiful long tail streamers. And VM's doing some miraculous work staying on them. They're such fast flying birds. And wasn't that perfect timing? Now, as it gets further away, I've got my phone out. And I can now show you some pictures. So that's uh, a drawing. And let's try and get some photos, rather. Are there going to be any photos? There we go. There you get a better indication of how fantastic these birds are. And they were just perched nearby when we drove past, and that's when I pieced the puzzle together and decided to have a look in that road culvert. And that's the little eggs that will be hiding within that mud tunnel. It almost flew in. I don't know if you see, it, it's, it's coming past again. Let's watch closely. Oh, thinking about it. Well, this is positive confirmation that I wasn't talking any rubbish, and in it goes. Cha ching! <laughs> well, and out it goes. Well, that was a bonus, and we don't want to cause any stress to these birds. They obviously think we're trying to eat the babies or the eggs, which we're, of course, not trying to do at all. Um, I prefer ostrich eggs, personally. These would be a bit too small for me. So, we're going to continue on. And we're not too far from Sydney's water, so hoping we're going to find some action there. But for now, you guys are back to the action with James. So it's not often you're sitting at a lion kill that you feel a slight pang of jealousy. Scott's ability to spot nests is quite unparalleled in the annals of history, I believe. And what a wonderful thing to see a red-breasted swallow in the nest. I think that is just, that's incredible. I can't wait to see the footage of that. <laughs> Let there be no doubt as to the egalitarian nature of lion society. You can see that they are fighting over the food. There is no love lost at a kill like this. There's no sharing like there would be with wild dogs. It's all a fight. The most dominant lioness here is the biggest one, the one who can bully the others the most. And Tony, as you say, I mean, before that growl, it does appear to be slightly unusually um, orderly dining here. It is because there's enough space for them all, but I think things will get a little tense as the meat starts to be finished. You can see the two in your picture there. Um, are difficult to describe. So one on your right-hand side of your picture and then the one that is almost invisible, the other side of your picture. Um, those two are holding on to the same piece of meat. They are not letting go, and I think that they will have a scrap with each other fairly soon. You can see the light is now starting to fade. I'm not going to stay here after dark, everyone. We're just going to enjoy this in the day. So not a huge fan of light shining. If it needs to be done, it needs to be done. That's fine. But if we can look at an animal during the day, we will. But we still have a good 40 minutes of drive or so left. So we'll stay with them probably until then. Just incredible stuff to see. And this landscape in which those lions are lying 
is not a summer landscape. This is a winter moonscape at the moment, not a blade of grass on this dirt that they're lying in. They would normally be lying in a verdant green lawn. Above them, the trees would be sort of shading them with deep greens. Instead, we've got autumn colours all around now. What an incredible, incredible experience that was. It's very seldom that I've actually seen the actual kill, the death moment. And it is a profound experience. That those two on the left-hand side there, those ones that, sorry, sent a picture for you, they're not eating the hip, not the hip, the, the coccyx, the, um, the pelvis. So once they're down there, they must have eaten pretty much all of the good cuts of meat. And it's not easy, you know. I'm, I'm picking a carcass clean like this cannot be easy at all. from Nebraska, you've sent through a wonderful quote from Gahil Gibran, and unfortunately Kirsten has well overestimated my ability to remember such a quote in one go, so I'm going to ask her to read it to me again, it's very beautiful. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for that, Pat. And you can see that the, as the light fades, so these lions become, they blend more and more into their environment. Now, Steph, you're in Boston and you want to know how long it will be before the lions move on, try and find something else to eat. I don't think they'll be here tomorrow morning unless they uh, decide they're quite full. They might s spend the night here snoozing a bit. But the zebra's not going to last long. I, like I say, I don't think more than another, I said an hour initially, I said maybe, maybe two hours. Then I think they'll probably give up. They may then just rest here for the rest of the night, if they're a bit peckish still. I mean, they could certainly eat more than just this little zebra, so they might try and move on through the night and see if they can catch something else. That's quite possible, Steph, uh, but they might not. You can see here, they're still fighting with each other. Covered in blood. Dave, you want me to light it up a bit? It's all right, eh? It's all right. Yeah. Hmm. And Erin, you're in Michigan, and you're wondering... <coughs> You're wondering about what the most difficult prey for lions to catch would be, given that they've taken down this tiny little zebra, which would have proved almost no challenge at all. Um, interestingly, Erin, adult zebra are not easy for them to take down. They're very fast, they're very strong, they kick powerfully. But I'd say out here, if they weren't going for something unusual, like an elephant or a rhino or a, or a hippo, for example, which would be extremely unusual. Of their sort of standard issue prey items, I think you'd find a giraffe was the most difficult for them to try and take down. And that's because giraffe are obviously much bigger. They can kick effectively with back feet and front feet. And so I would say for the lion pride like this, a giraffe or a big male buffalo would be the most difficult for them to take down. That is Brent leaving us. 
So I'm going to assume that everybody is happy to stay here. And uh, if you would like to move on, um, well, you can say so. I think, though, we'll probably stay here for the rest of the drive. I'm fascinated by this. And there goes Aubrey also. And we'll, we'll get a new angle just now. Oh, wonderful. Scott has found some elephants. Let's go and take a look. Well, what a wonderful view it is out here overlooking Sydney's waterhole on this gloomy evening with a large herd of elephants, some of which are on the northern side of the waterhole and the others are on the southern side. There's a small little kind of man-made watering point, which is just ooh, over there where those ones are. So that's kind of a little freshwater outlet that they'll be enjoying. Hard to see from here, but there is a small trough there. There you can just make it out. And then the main water hole is remains of rainfall from previous seasons. But it's quite quickly decreasing, and I wonder when it will, in fact, dry up. Or let's just hope it doesn't. It's a major water source for a lot of animals, and it has been providing us with some great sightings over the last few weeks. And not only that will they be enjoying their slightly lubricated meals that they're feeding on, but they'll also be enjoying this cool weather. A huge relief after all of the hot weather we've been experiencing. Looks like a few young bulls having some argy-bargy there. Playing around with one another. A few other animals that we could expect to arrive at any stage are hyena. I've noticed that there's a couple of hyena that at just about this stage every evening, they come from some mud wallows. Um, guessing somewhere off Voyatella Access Road, not too far from here, and they come from a southerly direction to the north for their evening drink before heading out to look for some meals. So don't be surprised if some hyena come onto the scene. A blacksmith lapwing calling there. Chip, 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 chip. Well, yeah, there's some uh, great one, news, two, and one of our long term viewers, Shell in Illinois, was hoping for us to find her some elephants on a very special day called uh, your birthday. <laughs> and Cheryl, it's a great pleasure to wish you happy birthday and provide you with this herd of elephants. What a bonus! Hope you're having a great day, wherever you may be. I think in Illinois, you said. And this is quite a large herd. It could be two different herds that have converged simultaneously, or possibly just one big one. I'm not too sure how, how many are in there. We can try and count. Oh, look at the hippo. Hello. You come to say hello to the elephant. That's quite strange. It looks like... A small hippo. And I'm, I wonder if it's not eating the elephant dung due to desperation. Could be. It's too far to see, though. They technically shouldn't because they prefer feeding on grass, but during a drought, strange things may happen. Look at the elephant just kick that dust at it. Like I said, it's not a large hippo. Certainly not fully grown. This is fascinating. And who knows why it's coming out at these elephants. We could see something quite horrible happen. You could see these elephants run into it and barge it. Like I said, during droughts, strange things happen, especially these two bulls who are playing with one another. They may decide to start playing with that hippo. And I've seen footage of elephants teaching hippo, rhino, buffalo very cruel lessons and bullying them, sometimes to the point of death. Like I said, this hippo is small. Let's see what it does here. I 
Maybe it's merely that it's very hungry, and that's no surprise. During the drought, you'll often find hippos retreating from the water early. They're nocturnal grazers in search of food to fill their hungry bellies. I'm worried that these young bulls that this hippo is heading towards are going to give it a bit of attitude. Let's see what happens. Oh, here we go. The bulls have seen it. Let's see what happens. Obviously, we don't have the best view now because it's on the other side and we cannot move. Trust me, if we could get closer, I would love to, but this is north of our northern boundary. Here comes the hippo, there goes the bull. As soon as it turns and shows any sign of weakness, you may find the Ellie bulls turning on it more aggressively. But not so much. Not so much that I thought they would. Oh, that slightly bigger bull is now throwing its trunk out. Fascinating stuff. Nothing too serious, though, thankfully, for that little hippo. But some very interesting interactions between those two large species. Um, I believe James told you he thinks it's the elephant and the giraffe that are the hardest animals for lions to take down. I think he may have forgotten about the hippo and the rhino because those two are also two very big animals um, that we get in this area. And let's just see what happens here if there's not any more interactions that may unfold. Oh, no, it looks like the hippo is cleverly retreated back into the water. And it looks like the elephants are going to retreat in the opposite direction, away from the water. What a beautiful scene this is. Now, Cheryl, we can try and count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I'll say at least 20, but possibly 25 to 30. I just did a very quick head count. And like I said earlier, it would be nice to try and get a little bit closer, but there's something I love about the view from here, and even though it's quite far away, oh, there's one way off in the distance that looks like a big bull. I mean, that is far, far away. And it still looks really impressive, the one on the opposite side of the dam wall. But this view is quite spectacular, and being forced to enjoy this vista from a distance is, like I say, a scenario that we don't often have. Hello, Papas, and you're interested to know my thoughts on man-made waterholes and how much of an effect they may have in the evolution of a species. Um, sure, well, evolution takes many, many hundreds of years, but I guess if the waterholes are here long enough, it will have, therefore, evolutionary impacts on it. But what we need to remember is that Papas, as soon as uh, us humans uh, started gaining brain power over the animals around us and the the, essentially ruining the planets to the point that we have now uh, and ruining habitats and causing animals to have these tiny little pockets to live in often fenced reserves like the Kruger National Park it's a ginormous ginormous fenced reserve um, you need to you don't need to um, but there's very good arguments for putting in man-made water holes I mean it's as natural as the ecosystem can be but it's not entirely natural because there's fences around it and animals cannot move freely as they could many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, well, not even that long ago, maybe a couple of thousand years ago. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, there are certain arguments and people that will be completely against man-made waterholes um, and other arguments for them where they can be useful, like I say, in areas that are fenced off like here, where we are on the Sabi Sand. So I don't think it's going to have any major negative effects. I know a lot of the waterholes in the Kruger National Park have been closed. There were many waterholes many years ago, and then they realized that maybe it's not 
good to have too many in places where there shouldn't be water, but in certain areas, it's okay to have them. So the, the movement is definitely towards less water holes, but um, like I said, there's different arguments for, uh, for them and, and, and against them. And because we don't know enough history of animal populations, of weather, uh, of animals' migratory routes and movements from many years ago, it's hard to be able to uh, decisively know or conclusively work out what is the right thing to do. So, a good question, um, and one that's difficult for me to answer, like I, like I said, for, for all those reasons. Tom and Dallas? You would like to know how long do I think this waterhole will last for? And I would say um, at least another month um, without any rain. So um, it's still good for, yeah, like I said, at least a month, possibly even a, a, a month and a half would be my guess without any extra rain. But I'm told that we can be expecting some decent rain, I think, later on this week. The weather gurus seem to forecast that, which is great. Okay, I'm sure you are all wondering what is going on with the lions. So, why don't you head over to James and see what exactly they're up to now. Unsurprisingly, we haven't left. Everyone else has left. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit more normally now because these microphones do struggle to pick my voice up when I'm talking whisper style. Uh, but the lions aren't affected by my voice at this stage, so I'm just going to talk to you like this. Uh, not much has happened other than they, one of them has already finished feeding. She's the one closest to us there in front. She's cleaning the blood and gore off her feet. She looks very satisfied with her afternoon's activities. And the rest of them are still eating. And they, they seem to have calmed down. There's the odd growl, there's the odd sort of uh, 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 at each other. But pretty much, I think most of the good stuff's done, you know. Oh, Scott's got something special for Walt. Well, Walt, I hope you're still with the water back. It's not going to be good enough for your profile picture, but. There goes the telltale white rump of a big male water buck. It's just crossed over the road. And uh, just to know, we had, hadn't forgotten about your request, Walt, but it looks like you may have to wait for the sunrise safari or tomorrow's sunset safari to get your profile picture. We're going to send you back to James. Well, Walt, I hope you enjoyed your water buck. I've never been asked for a water buck before. I think that's wonderful. There's a line that's just getting up now. Same, hung, less than hungry one, walking around just to check Dave out, see what he looks like, see if she might like to eat him. But no. So you can see they're not full. Very interesting that. So, I mean, this would have been a nice meal for them, but she certainly doesn't look that full at all. She's standing only about three meters from us. That's about 12 feet. And she stands at the shoulder about four feet tall. So, I mean, she stands quite high. That's beautiful. Let me just I'll try and put a bit of light on her if you want, Dave. That's just the diffused light on the side of the car. Give you a better idea of her colour. And that's not amber eyes. Of course, she's got very beautiful eyes, that one, but they're not the amber eyes. I don't think. No, they're not. Now she will clean the blood off her face. That will stop the flies coming to sit on her. It probably tastes quite nice to her as well and it will also keep off the bacteria. Now, Evie, you want to know, you obviously noticed them licking the zebra there at the beginning of the kill, and you want to know why they do that. 
Evie, you're absolutely correct. They've got sandpaper-like tongues, just like a house cat, obviously, but twice as strong and twice as hard. And they are trying to take the hair off the zebra so that they can get in amongst the skin. They reckon that were a large male lion to lick you fully over the top of the skull, it would move all the skin off your head. So, I mean, they do have tremendously powerful tongues. And she's just, she's been looking around as she came away from the kill, and I wonder if there isn't, she hasn't picked up the scent of that hyena that was here earlier. Isn't she beautiful? Very satisfying afternoon she's had. You can see the blood all over her face there. And she's beginning the laborious process of now cleaning that off. Of course, it will, apart from just attracting flies, well, not in weather like this, but in the heat, it will also attract infection. And I think that's one of the reasons that cats are such fastidious cleaners of their faces. They don't want any of that blood and gore that could attract bacterial infections on their faces. And they're kind of very fastidious about cleaning it off. While dogs won't clean themselves, they'll clean each other. Hyenas don't seem to... Ooh, we've got some action there, Dave. Fighting with each other, you can just hear that blood-curdling sound. There are some flies there, if you can believe it. Look at that. <laughs> there are already flies there. Even though it's a cold day. stop fighting with each other now. Not so cross. Now, there are a few things I wanted to say. Just there's amber eyes. Look at her eyes. There you can see. Look how, look how orange they are. Isn't that lovely? Sometimes I look at the others and I think, oh, is that her? And then I see those orange eyes looking at me. That's beautiful. Now, there were two things I wanted to say. The first was that, obviously, the chase through here was a bit hairy in terms of the amount of noise that we made. And I just wanted to reiterate to you that I'm pretty careful about which trees we run over. A lot of them just pop up behind us. And the particular area that we went through is filled with um, what we call a black monkey orange, which is an invasive species. Well, not an invasive, it's an encroacher species. So I don't believe we did any ecological damage there at all. And also, remember, it sounds a lot worse through the microphones than it does in real life. And the second thing is to say that I'm more than happy to shine a light on these lions because they are the apex predator out here, apart from us, of course. I don't believe that there's sufficient hyena activity here to possibly threaten them, and I don't think the light affects that situation anyway for lions. So please don't worry that we are causing them any undue sort of stress or any undue th threatening them in any way with the light. It's perfectly acceptable. We do it often and they are absolutely fine with it. There are many animals we wouldn't shine the light on, but lions are not one of those. So I just wanted to reiterate that for those of you who perhaps were worried about it, because I know sometimes uh, it can look a little bit stark when you stick a light on these animals like this. Now, speaking of the hyenas, let's go to Scott. Hello everyone, and we've got another carnival that we would like to show you here. We're just getting into position. Give us a second. We're gonna get some great view of two hyena that are slowly making their way towards us. Where have you sneaky characters disappeared to? I'm sure they're going to pop out here any second. I was just trying to loop ahead of them to get you some frontal views, but that appears to have possibly backfired. Come on, hyena. Oh, here we go. And 
So just moving parallel to us now, not as planned, but still some great views of them. There's the one, at least in front. And Vim, I'm gonna leave that one now and go to the one behind now. Um, it's probably gonna pop out into that little gap. Great work on camera there, Vim. They're looking quite sinister and spooky, and they look like they're heading straight to the Sydney's waterhole. Um, let's see if we can't get you any more good views. Good views. Which I think we might be able to. Yeah, this is going to be great. Oh, another one's calling. Hopefully these ones will return the call. It's just behind the bush. Here it comes. Please call for us. Please, 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 please. Other ones just in the background there, VM. Great work. Oh, I really was hoping they were gonna call for us. It's one of the most awesome calls to hear from close, but alas, no luck tonight. Maybe those ladies are going to call for you, though, by the end of the safari. That will be great. Well, what a bonus. A carnival-filled afternoon, and we're going to send you back to the lions now. Now, the lions have heard something off in the bush there. They're all looking. I'm going to get the spotlight out and just... Just flick it through the bush there and see if there isn't something coming like a clan of hyenas. I don't think there is. Oh, I can hear some lions calling. That's what it is. Miles away, miles away. Probably in the middle of Mala Mala. Long, long way to the southeast there. Here comes the second lioness now. Isn't that wonderful? They're now they're three feet from us. And while we were off air, of course, I remembered that for Dave, this is a very new experience. He hasn't done wildlife before in this line set. three feet from us, and Dave said, um, how are you so confident that we're safe over here? Now, of course, if you haven't seen lions at that difference, at that distance, it's terrifying. And the answer, of course, is that they just don't see us in the same way that they do when we're on foot, and they certainly don't see us as prey. Are they just lying down there, Dave? It's very dark, yeah. Okay. I don't want you to shine. You don't have to shine in the middle. You just do that up. Tom, I'm just, we're just going to quickly show you where they are. I'm not going to move at this stage because they're a bit close. I haven't got a shot. Oh, yeah, you don't have a shot. And Tom, you want to know if we're safe when they finish or when they move on? Yes, absolutely. I didn't park where that lioness came and sat, remember? She was sitting in front of us and then she moved and she felt very comfortable to come and sit there. She didn't feel threatened. She certainly doesn't see us as something to eat. Magnificent sighting. Just very, very special. Hello, Sarah. You want to know which one is Amber Eyes? Um, Sarah, the one with her back to us now and her jaws clamped shut on the right-hand side of your screen, I think, is Amber Eyes. Those are the eyes that I saw as Amber when she turned. And let's, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's who it is, Sarah, but let's have a look when she turns, if she turns. You can see that the other three, other two, sorry, have given up on this carcass now, and I don't feel that there's sufficient left to warrant them even having any sort of fight over it. And what a difference an hour can make. We arrived here about an hour ago, and that was a mewling thing, a heart-wrenching sound coming out of its lungs. And now, it's a bit of leather and old bone, really. 
they can hear the lions, they can hear the males calling, miles away. Every time they call, they look up. All I can hear is, ooh, 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 which you won't be able to hear. Now, Darlene in New, in New Hampshire, very nice. Of course, we talked about the hyenas. They might try and scavenge this kill if a large group of them came through here. I don't think a large group will come through here. At this stage, there's not much for them to kill anyway. You want to know about the avian scavengers, the vultures. Would they come into the trees now, or are they only daytime scavengers? Darling, two things. They're only daytime scavengers, and secondly, they will struggle to fly in weather like this. They've moved away from behind us now. Don't worry about it, Dave. Let's keep our eyes on these ones. Um, and Darlene, so on, even on a day like this, if they'd killed this, say, at 12 o'clock this afternoon, vultures would not be flying on a day like today because there aren't any thermals. They, that flapping flight that they do is very uncomfortable. It's not particularly uh, efficient for them. And so, no, only when it warms up would the vultures start to fly, then they'd spot the carcass and they'd come down here. They have to they fly with their sight. And they find their kills with sight, not with smell. The other two are just resting quietly behind us. Hmm. Now all around us, a few sounds of the night are starting up. Again, it will be a quieter night because there's this kind of low-hanging cloud. So I can hear the odd spotted thick knee calling. No night jars today. Some crickets some brave crickets that have managed to survive this dry summer. Lovely sounds of the night which almost creep up on you without you realizing it. Suddenly there are crickets stridulating around the place. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sound. Hello Pelican Penny, how very wonderful to hear from you, how wonderful that you are watching us. Thank you for sending through a question. And remember, all of you who are watching for the first or second time, perhaps you're a bit nervous to send through a question, you think it might not be a valid question or it might be a stupid question, please don't feel like that at all. Please feel comfortable and free to send us any questions you like. Pelican Penny, you want to know if the mother of this hapless foal, who is almost finished now, would come looking for the foal, or does she know it's dead? Pelican Penny, they were alarm calling around the kill during the course of its demise. So they, they would have heard it making that horrible bleating sound, and they, the rest of the herd was around here making that alarm call that wah, 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 wah. She will be well aware that the foal is no longer. They don't defend their foals against lions, once the lions have caught the foal, and that's simply because the risk is too great. And so she will be aware. And of course the next question, Pelican Penny, is is there a period of mourning? Do they mourn the loss of their youngsters? Um, from a purely evolutionary point of view, to me it makes sense that they would. Because if they didn't, if they didn't feel an attachment to the car, to the foal, their motherly instinct, of course, I think would be that much weaker. So there must be a period during which there is a feeling of, uh, I don't know if it's sadness, I don't know if it is um, loss or even just confusion perhaps, we don't really know. Uh, from an emotional point of view or a human point of view, I've seen animals, I've seen impala, I've seen giraffe, I've seen buffalo that have lost youngsters to predators. And I get a tremendous sense that there is a sense of mourning, there is a period during which those animals seem to feel sad. Now, I know there'll be a number of very kind of old school biologists that will say, no, 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 animals don't feel emotions like that. Well, 
I don't believe that, I'm afraid. I used to. I don't anymore. Just keeping an eye on those ones behind us. They seem to be fast asleep. And please, Pelican Penny and any others who are sending us new questions, please tell us where you're from. It really is lovely to know where you're from, whereabouts on the great wide planet Earth you happen to be joining us on safari from. There's the last bits of the legs going there. Let's head across to Scott now for his last segment, and I'm going to stay right here. Hello everyone, and we are on the search for any interesting nocturnal critters. I mentioned earlier, Brent did well to find a tiny little chameleon last night, and I fear that this drought is taking its toll on those little reptiles. We are not seeing nearly as many as you usually would in a summer, so I'm not sure if they're dying of thirst because they can't move from you know, a waterhole as easily as an elephant can to the next. Um, so I'm guessing they rely on drinking a lot of moisture off leaves and or prey, but their prey has also been fairly scarce, not nearly as many insects as normal. Or there's a third possible uh, theory, which would be the best one for the chameleons, and that is because there's so many dead leaves, abnormally so, at this time of year, it's making spotting them difficult, because essentially all you're looking for when looking for a chameleon is uh, a slight abnormality or slight change in shade from a tree that would ordinarily be all one color green. But now because there's so many dead leaves, different shades, they could be helping the chameleons to melt in and camouflage. They're usually, like I say, a pale shade, the chameleons. Anyway, it's been great fun having you guys out with us as always. And, oh, I think we might be in luck. Yay! We are in luck. And, Bulber Kit, you would like to know, while VM zooms into this little chameleon, this one's a medium-sized one, probably born this time last year, I'm guessing. Um, so that's great news. Maybe it's just that we haven't been looking closely enough for them. Sorry, Bill, you would like to know how far does sound travel at night? Well, on a still night like this with not much wind, very far. You could, if I probably screamed as loudly as I could, you could probably hear me from at least a kilometer away, just over half a mile. So the sound does travel, but it does depend on the conditions. Also, the fact that there's not much vegetation at the moment will have a big impact on that. The sound won't be as absorbed as much as it normally would in a typical thick summer. So winter, when it's very dry, the sound travels even further. Guys, it's been incredibly good fun driving through the rain with all of you. VM, thanks for your camera work. Thanks, Kirsty, for directing the show, and Nikki for lending a hand. And well done to James and David for getting you some great up-close action with those lions and their zebracle. We're going to send you back to him now and see you all on the Sunrise Safari. Yet again, Scott Dyson's astonishing eyes never cease to amaze me. But while he was finding the chameleons, the lions, the three of them have been eating there. You can see the hip bone of that little zebra there, and that's kind of the last of it, I think. I don't think I'm 99% sure they will not be here during the course of tomorrow morning. Where they will go, however, is not clear. They are in the center of their territory, well, they're not, they're actually in the southern parts of their territory, encroaching on Styx Pride area now. So with any luck, they'll go north towards the Juma Dam. So watch out for them on the Pan Cam tonight and see if they don't pop around. Well, it's been an astonishing afternoon of amazing emotions for me. I know that I've seen this before, but it doesn't, it never ceases to really change for me. If to see the life of an animal snuffed out like that is, it's a profoundly, um, it's troubling to some extent, but it's also very primeval and I think it's valuable to be honest. 
Thank you for joining us for this drive today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to Kirsty and to Nikki in the final control, and of course to Scott and VM on the other vehicle. We will see you tomorrow morning at 0530. Stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.